Chapter 23 of Lives of Poor Boys Who Became Famous. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. The Lives of Poor Boys Who Became Famous by Sarah Knowles Bolton. Thomas Cole. Four of my favorite pictures from childhood had been Cole's Voyage of Life. I have studied the tiny infant in the boat surrounded by roses, life stream full of luxuriant vegetation, the happy, ambitious youth, looking eagerly forward to the temple of fame, steering the boat himself, with no need of aid from his guardian angel, then the worried and troubled man, his boat tossing and whirling among the broken trees, and frightful storms that come to all and lastly, perhaps most beautiful, the old man sailing peacefully into the ocean of eternity, the angel having returned to guide him, and the way to heaven being filled with celestial spirits. I have always hung these pictures near my writing table, and their lesson has been a helpful and inspiring one. No wonder that Thorwaldsen, the great sculptor, said when he looked upon them in Rome, O oh, great artist, what beauty of conception! what an admirable arrangement of parts what an accurate study of nature what truth of detail he told cole that his work was entirely new and original executed in a masterly manner and he commended the harmony of color these pictures are hung in thousands of homes but how few persons know the history of the artist born in england february first eighteen o one the only son of a family of eight children and the youngest but one we find him when a mere child in some print works learning to engrave simple designs for calico his father a woolen manufacturer had failed in business and the family were thrown upon themselves for support he was a kind and honest man always hoping to succeed but never succeeding always trying new scenes to build up his fortune and never building it like other fathers especially those who have been disappointed in life he had hopes that his boy would accomplish more than himself he wished to apprentice him to an attorney or to an iron manufacturer but thomas saw no pleasure in blackstone or in handling ponderous iron a boy of tender feelings he found little companionship with his fellow operatives most of whom were rough and he enjoyed most an old scotchman who could repeat ballads and tell of the beautiful hills and lakes of his native land when he had leisure he wandered with his sister sarah into the surrounding country and while she sang he accompanied her with his flute with little opportunity for school he was a great reader and when through with designs for calico for the day he buried himself in books especially about foreign countries and in imagination clambered over high mountains and sailed over broad rivers he talked much to the family of the wonders of the new world and when he was eighteen they all sailed for america the father rented a little house and shop in philadelphia and began to sell the small stock of dry goods which he had brought with him while thomas found work with a person who supplied woodcuts for printers the father soon became dissatisfied with his prospects and moved his family to steubenville ohio where he hoped to find a land flowing with milk and honey thomas remained behind working on some illustrations for bunyan's holy war keeping up his spirits with his beloved flute going to steubenville the next year walking almost the entire way from philadelphia here he worked in his father's small manufactory of paper hangings yet he had longings to do some great work in the world as he wandered alone in the wild and charming scenery he loved music architecture and pictures but he hardly dared breathe his aspirations save in a few verses of poetry how in that quiet home a boy should be born who had desires to win renown was a mystery nobody knows where the perilous but blessed gift of ambition comes about this time a portrait painter by the name of steen came to the village he took an interest in the poetic boy and loaned him an english illustrated work on painting thomas had already acquired some skill in drawing now his heart was on fire as he read about raphael claude lorraine and titian and he resolved to make painting his life work how little he knew of the obstacles before a poor artist he set to work to make his own brushes obtaining his colors from a chair maker 
His easel and palette were made of his own crude manufacture. His father had serious misgivings for his son, but his mother encouraged him to persevere in whatever his genius seemed to lie. As a rule, women discover genius sooner than men, and good Mary Cole has seen that there was something uncommon in her boy. His brushes ready, putting his scanty wearing apparel and his flute in a green baize bag, hung over his shoulder, the youth of twenty-one started for St. Clairsville, thirty miles distant to begin a life as a painter. He broke through the ice in crossing a stream, and, wet to his breast, arrived at the town, only to find that a German had just been there, and had painted all the portraits which were desired. However, a saddler was found who was willing to be painted, and after five days of work, from morning till night, the young artist received a new saddle as pay. A military officer gave him an old silver watch for a portrait, and a dapper tradesman, a chain and key, which proved to be copper instead of gold. For some other work he received a pair of shoes and a dollar. All these, except the dollar, he was obliged to give to his landlord for board, the man being dissatisfied even with this bargain. From here Thomas walked one hundred miles to Zanesville, and to his great sorrow, found that the German had preceded him there also, and painted the tavern keeper and his family. The landlord intimated that a historical picture would be taken in payment for the young stranger's board. Accordingly, an impromptu studio was arranged. A few patrons came at long intervals, but it was soon evident that another field must be chosen. What, however, was young Cole's astonishment to find that the historical painting would not be received for board, and that if thirty-five dollars were not paid at once, he would be thrust into jail. Two or three acquaintances became surety for the debt to the unprincipled landlord, and the pale slender artist hastened toward Chillicothe with but a sixpence in his pocket. After walking for three days, seventy-five miles, he sat down under a tree by the roadside, well nigh discouraged, in the hot August day, but when the tears gathered in his eyes, he took out his flute, and playing a lively air, his courage returned. He had two letters of introduction in his pocket, given him at Zanesville, and these he would present, whispering to himself that he must hold up his head like Michelangelo, as he offered them. The men who received them had little time or wish to aid the young man. A few persons sat for their portraits, and a few took lessons in drawing, but after a time he had no money to pay for washing his linen, and at last no linen even to be washed. Still enthusiastic over art, and with visions of Italy floating in his mind, yet penniless and footsore, he returned to Steubenville to tell his sorrows to his sympathetic mother. How her heart must have been moved, as she looked upon her boy's pale face and great blue eyes, and felt his eager desire for a place of honor in the world, but knew, alas, that she was powerless to aid him. He took a plain room for a studio, painted some scenes for a society of amateur actors, and commenced two pictures, Ruth gleaning in the field of Boaz, and the feast of Belshazzar. One Sunday, some vicious boys broke into the studio, mixed the paints, broke the brushes, and cut the paintings in pieces. Learning that the boys were poor, Cole could not bear to prosecute them, and the matter was dropped. He soon departed to Pittsburgh, whither his parents had moved, and began to assist his father in making floor cloths. Every moment of leisure, he was down by the banks of the Monongahela, carefully drawing tree, or cloud, or hilltop. Finally the longings became irresistible. He packed his little trunk, his mother threw over his shoulders the tablecloth, with her blessing and her tears, and with six dollars in his purse, he said goodbye to the family and started for Philadelphia. Then followed, as he used to say in after years, the winter of his discontent. In a poor quarter of the city, in an upper room, without a bed or fire or furniture, struggled poor Thomas Cole. Timid, friendless, his only food, a baker's roll and a pitcher of water, his only bedding at night, the tablecloth. He worked day by day, now copying in the academy, and now ornamenting bellows, brushes, or Japan ware, with figures of birds or with flowers. Sometimes he ran down a neighboring alley, whipping his hands about him to keep his blood in circulation, lest he be benumbed. 
He soon became the victim of inflammatory rheumatism and was a great sufferer. He still saw before him, some way, somehow, renown. Meantime, his pure, noble soul found solace in writing poetry and an occasional story for the Saturday Evening Post. After a year and a half, he put his goods on a wheelbarrow, had them carried to the station, and started for New York, whither his family had moved. He was now 24. Life had been one continuous struggle. Still he loved each beauty in nature and hoped for the good time to come. In his father's garret in Greenwich Street, in a room so narrow that he could scarcely work, and so poorly lighted that he was, perpetually fighting a kind of twilight, he labored for two years. Obstacles seemed but to increase his determination to persevere. Oh, such grand material our heroes made. His first five pictures were placed for exhibition in the shop of an acquaintance and were sold at eight dollars apiece. Through the courtesy of a gentleman who purchased three of these, he was enabled to go up the Hudson and sketch from nature among the Catskills. This was indeed a great blessing. On his return, he painted a view of Fort Putnam, lake with dead trees, and the falls of the Catterskills. These were purchased for $25 apiece by three artists, Trumbull, Dunlap, and Durand. Trumbull first discovered the merits of the pictures, buying the falls for his studio, and invited Cole to meet Durand at his rooms. At the hour appointed, the sensitive artist made his appearance, so timid that at first he could only reply to their cordial questioning by monosyllables. Colonel Trumbull said, You surprise me at your age to paint like this. You have already done what I, with all my years and experience, am yet unable to do. Through the new friends, attention was called to his work, and he soon had abundant commissions. How his hungry heart must have fed on this appreciation. From that time, says his friend, William Cullen Bryant, he had a fixed reputation, and was numbered among the men of whom our country had reason to be proud. I well remember what an enthusiasm was awakened by these early works of his, the delight which was expressed at the opportunity of contemplating pictures, which carried the eye over scenes of wild grandeur, peculiar to our country, over our arid mountain tops, with their mighty growth of forest, never touched by the axe, along the banks of streams, never deformed by culture, and into the depth of skies, bright with the hues of our own climate, such skies as few but coal could ever paint, and through the transparent abysses of which it seemed that you might send an arrow out of sight. The struggles were not all over, but the renown of which the calico designer had dreamed had actually come. Down in the heart of Mary Cole, there must have been deep thanksgiving that she had urged him on. He, with a few others, now founded the National Academy of Design. He took lodgings in the Catskills in the summer of 1826, and worked diligently. He studied nature like a lover. Now he sketched a peculiar sunset, now a wild storm, now an exquisite waterfall. Why do not the younger landscape painters walk, walk alone and endlessly, he used to say, how I have walked, day after day, and all alone, to see if there was not something among the old things which was new. He knew every chasm, every velvety bank, every dainty flower growing in some tanglewood for miles around. American scenery, with its untamed wilderness, lake and mountain, was his chief passion. He found no pleasure, however, in hunting or fishing, for his kind heart could not bear to inflict the slightest injury. The following spring, he exhibited at the National Academy the Garden of Eden and the Expulsion, rich in poetic conception, and in the fall, sketched in the White Mountains, especially near North Conway, which the lamented Star King loved so well. In the winter, he was very happy, finishing his Chorcorua Peak. A visitor said, Your clouds, sir, appear to move. That, replied the artist, is precisely the effect I desire. He was now eager to visit Europe to study art, but first he must see Niagara, of which he made several sketches. He had learned the secret that all poets and artists finally learn, that they must identify themselves with some great event in history, something grand in nature, or some immortal name. Milton chose a sublime subject. 
Homer a great war, just as some one will make our civil war a famous epic two centuries hence. In June 1829, he sailed for Europe, and there, for two years, studied faithfully. In London, he saw much of Turner, of whom he said, I consider him as one of the greatest landscape painters that ever lived, and his temple of Jupiter as fine as anything the world has produced. In landscapes, my favorites are Claude Lorraine and Gaspar Poussin. Some of Cole's work was exhibited at the British Gallery, but the autumn coloring was generally condemned as false to nature. How little we know about what we have not seen. Paris he enjoyed greatly for its clear skies and sunny weather, essentials usually to those of poetic temperament, though he was not overly pleased with the Venuses and Psyches of modern French art. For nine months he found the galleries of Florence a paradise to a painter. He thought our skies more gorgeous than the Italian, though theirs have a peculiar softness and beauty. At Rome, some of his friends said, Cole works like a crazy man. He usually rose at five o'clock, worked till noon, taking an hour for eating and rest, and then sketched again till night. There was a reason for this. The support of the family came upon him, besides the payment of debts incurred by his father. He felt that every hour was precious. In Rome, he found the Pantheon simple and grand, the Apollo Belvedere, the most perfect of human productions, while the Venus de Medici has the excellence of feminine form, destitute in a great measure of intellectual expression, the transfiguration, beautiful in color and chiaroscuro, and Michelangelo's Moses, one of the things never to be forgotten. On his return to New York, he took rooms at the corner of Wall Street and Broadway. Here he won the friendship of Lumen Reed, for whom he promised to paint pictures for one room, to cost $5,000. The chief pictures for Mr. Reed, who died before their completion, were five, called The Course of Empire, representing man in different phases of savage life, high civilization, and ruin through sin, the idea coming to him while in Rome. Of this group, Cooper, the novelist, said, I consider the course of empire the work of the highest genius this country has ever produced, and one of the noblest works of art that has ever been wrought. In November 1836, Mr. Cole was married to Maria Bartow, a young lady of refinement and loveliness of character. Soon after, both his parents died. The departure and return were now painted, among his noblest works, says Bryant, followed by the voyage of life, for Mr. Samuel Ward, who, like Mr. Reed, died before the set was finished. This series was sold in 1876 for $3,100. These pictures he had worked upon with great care and intensity. He used to say, Genius was but one wing, and, unless sustained on the other side, by the well-regulated wing of assiduity, will quickly fall to the ground. The artist must work always. His eye and mind can work even when his pen is idle. He must, like a musician, draw a circle round him and exclude all intrusive spirits. And above all, if he would attain that serene atmosphere of mind in which float the highest conceptions of the soul, in which the sublimest works have been produced, he must be possessed of a holy and reasonable faith. The voyage of life was well received. The engraver, Mr. Smiley, found one morning before the second of the series, youth, a person in middle life looking as though in deep thought. Sir, he said at length, I am a stranger in the city and in great trouble of mind, but the sight of these pictures has done me great good. I go away from this place quieted and much strengthened to do my duty. In 1841, worn in health, Cole determined to visit Europe again. He wrote from Kenilworth Castle to his wife, every flower and mass of ivy, every picturesque effect, Waken my regret that you were not by my side. How can I paint without you to praise or to criticize, and little Teddy to come for Papa to go to dinner, and little Mary with her black eyes to come and kiss the figures in the pictures? My life will be burdened with sadness until I return to my wife and family. In Rome, he received much attention, as befitted one in his position. On his return, he painted several European scenes, the Roman Campania, Angels Ministering to Christ in the Wilderness, Mountain Ford, sold in 1876 for $900, The Good Shepherd, 
hunter's return mill at sunset and many others for his mount etna painted in five days he received five hundred dollars how different these days from that pitiful winter in philadelphia he dreaded interruptions in his work his saint john the baptist in the wilderness was destroyed by an unexpected visit from some ladies and gentlemen who quenched the fire of heart in which he was working he sorrowfully turned the canvas to the wall and never finished it he had now come to the zenith of his power yet he modestly said i have only learned how to paint he built a new studio in the catskills in the italian villa style and hoped to erect a gallery for several paintings he had in contemplation illustrating the cross and the world and the immortality of the soul but the overworked body at forty-seven years of age could no longer bear the strain on saturday february fifth eighteen forty eight he laid his colors under water and cleansed his palate as he left his studio the next day he was seized with inflammation of the lungs the following friday after the communion service at his bedside he said i want to be quiet these were his last words the tired artist had finished his work the voyage of life was over he had won enduring fame End of chapter 23Chapter 24 of Lives of Poor Boys Who Became Famous. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. Lives of Poor Boys Who Became Famous by Sarah Knowles Bolton. Oli Bull. In the quaint old town of Bergen, Norway, so strange with its narrow streets, peculiar costumes, and open-hearted people, that no traveller can ever forget it, was born, February 5, 1810, Ole Bull, the oldest in a family of ten children. His father was an able chemist, and his mother was a woman of fine manners and much intelligence. All the relatives were musical, and at the little gatherings for the purpose of cultivating this talent, the child Ole would creep under table or sofa and listen enraptured for hours, often receiving a whipping when discovered. He loved music intensely, fancying when he played alone in the meadows that he heard nature sing as the bluebells were moved among the grasses by the wind. When he was four years old, his uncle gave him a yellow violin, which he kissed with great delight, learning the notes at the same time as his primer. Although forbidden to play till study hours were over, he sometimes disobeyed, and was punished both at home and at school. Finally, at eight, through the good sense of his mother, a music teacher was provided, and his father bought him a new red violin. The child could not sleep for thinking of it, so the first night after its purchase he stole into the room where it lay, in his nightclothes, to take one peep at the precious thing. He said, years after, with tears in his eyes at the painful remembrance, The violin was so red, and the pretty pearl screws did smile at me so. I pinched the strings just a little with my fingers. It smiled at me ever more and more. I took up the bow and looked at it. It said to me it would be very pleasant to try it across the strings. So I did try it, just a very, very little, and it did sing to me so sweetly. At first I did play very soft, but presently I did begin a capriccio, which I like very much, and it did go ever louder and louder, and I forgot that it was midnight and that everybody was asleep. Presently I hear something crack, and the next minute I feel my father's whip across my shoulders. My little red violin dropped on the floor and was broken. I wept much for it, but it did no good. They did have a doctor to it next day, but it never recovered its health. Pitiful it is that sometimes parents are so lacking in judgment as to stifle the best things in a child's nature. Guiding is wise, forcing usually ends in disaster. In two years Ole could play pieces which his teacher found it impossible to perform. He began to compose melodies, imitating nature in the song of birds, brooks, and the roar of waterfalls, and he would hide in caves or in clumps of bushes where he could play his own weird improvisations. When he could not make his violin do as he wished, he would fling it away impetuously and not touch it again for a long time. Then he would perhaps get up in the middle of the night and play at his open window, 
forgetting that anybody might be awakened by it. Sometimes he played incessantly for days, scarcely eating or sleeping. He had no pleasure in fishing or shooting, on account of the pain inflicted, a feeling seemingly common to noble and refined natures, though he greatly enjoyed anything athletic. At fourteen, having heard of Paganini, he went to his grandparent, of whom he was very fond, and said, Dear grandmother, can't I have some of Paganini's music? Don't tell anyone, was the reply, but I will try to buy a piece of his for you, if you are a good child. Shortly after this an old miser, of whom the Bergen boys were afraid, called Ole to his house one day, as he was passing, and said, Are you the boy that plays the fiddle? Yes, sir. Then come with me. I have a fiddle I bought in England, that I want to show you. The fiddle needed a bridge and sounding post, and these the boy gladly whittled out, and then played for the old man his favorite air, God Save the King. He was treated to cakes and milk, and promised to come again. The next afternoon, what was his surprise to receive four pairs of doves, and a blue ribbon around the neck of one, and a card attached bearing the name of Ole Bull. This present was more precious than the diamonds he received in later years from the hands of royalty. Ole's father, with a practical turn of mind, urged him to become a clergyman, as he honored that profession, and well knew that music and art usually furnish a small bank account. A private tutor, Musaeus by name, was therefore engaged. This man had the unique habit of kneeling down to pray before he whipped a boy, and asking that the punishment might redound to the good of the lad. He soon made up his mind that Ole's violin and theology were incompatible, and forbade his playing it. Ole and his brothers bore his harsh methods as long as possible, when one morning at half-past four, as the teacher was dragging the youngest boy out of bed, Ole sprang upon him and gave him a vigorous beating. The smaller boys put their heads out from under their bedclothes and cried out, "'Don't give up, Ole! Don't give up! Give it to him with all your might!' The whole household soon appeared upon the scene, and though little was said, the private feeling seemed to be that a salutary lesson had been imparted. At eighteen, Ole was sent to the University of Christiana, his father beseeching him that he would not yield to his passion for music. On his arrival, some Bergen students asked him to play for a charitable association, but, said Ole, my father has forbidden me to play. Would your father prevent you doing an act of charity? Well, this alters the case a little, and I can write him and claim his pardon. After this he played nearly all night at the home of one of the professors, saying to himself that his father would be pleased if the faculty liked him, and the next morning failed in his Latin examinations. In despair he stated the case to the professor, who replied, My good fellow, this is the very best thing that could have happened to you. Do you believe yourself fitted for a curacy in Finmark, or a mission among the Laps? Certainly not. It is the opinion of your friends that you should travel abroad. Meanwhile, old Thrain having been taken ill, you are appointed ad interim musical director of the Philharmonic and Dramatic Societies. A month later, by the death of Thrain, he came into this position, having gained the pardon of his disappointed father." But he was restless at Christiana. He desired to know whether he really had genius or not, and determined to go to Cassel, to see Louis Sofer, who was considered a master. The great man was not sufficiently great to be interested in an unknown lad, and coolly said, when Ole remarked politely, I have come more than five hundred miles to hear you. Very well, you can now go to Nordhausen. I am to attend a music festival there. Ole went to the festival and was so disappointed because the methods and interpretation were different from his own, that he resolved to go back to classic studies, feeling that he had no genius for music. Still he was not satisfied. He would go to Paris, and hear Berlioz, and the other great men, giving three concerts at Trondheim and Bergen, by which he made five hundred dollars, he found himself in possession of the needed funds. When he arrived in this great city, everybody was eagerly looking out for himself. Some were in pursuit of pleasure, but most, as the case everywhere, were in pursuit of bread and shelter. Nobody cared to hear his violin. Nobody cared about his recommendations from far off Norway. In vain he tried to make engagements. He had no one to speak for him, and the applicants were numberless. Madame Malibran was singing nightly to crowded houses, and the poor violinist would now and then purchase one of the topmost seats and listen to that marvelous voice. His money was gradually melting away. 
Finally, an elderly gentleman who boarded at the same house, having begged him to take what little money he possessed out of the bank, as it was not a safe place, stole every cent, together with Ole's clothes, and left him entirely destitute. An acquaintance now told him of a boarding place where there were several music teachers, and gave security for his board for one month, twelve dollars. Soon the friend and the boarding mistress grew cold and suspicious. Nothing tries friendship like asking the loan of money. At last his condition becoming known to a person, whom he afterward learned, was Vidoc, the noted chief of police. He was shown by him to a gaming table, where he made one hundred and sixty dollars. What a horrid pleasure to hold in the hand one's own soul saved by the spoil of others! He could not gamble again, though starvation actually stared him in the face. Cholera was sweeping through the city, and had taken two persons from the house where he lodged. He was again penniless and well-nigh despairing, but he would not go back to Christiana. The river Seine looked inviting, and he thought death would be a relief. He was nervous, and his brain throbbed. Finally he saw a placard in the window, furnished rooms to let. He was exhausted, but would make one more effort. An elderly lady answered his query by saying that they had no vacant rooms, when her pretty granddaughter, Alexandrine Felice, called out, "'Look at him, Grandmamma. Putting on her glasses, the tears filled her eyes as she saw a striking resemblance to her son who had died. The next day found him at Madame Villemonot's house, very ill of brain fever. When he regained consciousness, she assured him that he need not worry about the means for payment. When, however, the musical lyceum of Christiana learned of his struggles, they sent him eight hundred dollars. Becoming acquainted about this time with Monsieur Lacour, a dealer in violins, who thought he had discovered that a certain kind of varnish would increase sweetness of tone, Ole Bull was requested to play on one of his instruments at a soiree given by a duke of the Italian legation. An elegant company were present. The intense heat soon brought out the odor of asafoetida in the varnish. The young man became embarrassed, and then excited, and played as though beside himself. The player was advertised, whether Monsieur Lacour's instruments were or not, for Marshal Nee's son, the Duke of Montebello, at once invited him to breakfast, and presided over a concert for him, whereby the violinist made three hundred dollars. The tide had turned at last, and little Felice Villemonot had done it with her, look at him, Grandmamma. As the grand opera was still closed to him, he made a concert tour through Switzerland and Italy. In Milan, one of the musical journalists said, He is not master of himself. He has no style. He is an untrained musician. If he be a diamond, he is certainly in the rough and unpolished. Ole Bull went at once to the publisher and asked him who had written the article. If you want the responsible person, said the editor, I am he. No, said the artist, I have not come to call the writer to account, but to thank him. The man who wrote that article understands music, but it is not enough to tell me my faults. He must tell me how to rid myself of them. You have the spirit of the true artist, replied the journalist. The same evening he took Ole Bull to the critic, a man over seventy, from whom he learned much that was valuable. He at once gave six months to study under able masters, before again appearing in public. He was, however, an earnest student all through life, never being satisfied with his attainments. At Venice he was highly praised, but at Bologna he won the celebrity which continued through his life. Malibran was to sing in two concerts, but feigned illness when she learned that the man she loved, de Barreau, was to receive the smaller sum than herself and would not appear. The manager of the theatre was in despair. Meantime, in a poor hotel, in an upper room, Ole Bull was composing his concerto in the daytime and playing on his violin at night by his open window. Rossini's first wife heard the music and said, It must be a violin, but a divine one. There will be a substitute for de Barreau and Malibran. I must go and tell Zampieri, the manager. On the night of the concert, after Ole Bull had been two hours in bed from weariness, Zampieri arrived and asked him to improvise. He was delighted, and exclaiming, Malibran may now have her headaches, hurried the young artist off to the theatre. The audience was of course cold and disappointed, till Ole Bull began to play. Then the people seemed to hold their breath. When the curtain fell, he almost swooned with exhaustion, but the house shook with applause. 
Flowers were showered upon him. He was immediately engaged for the next concert. A large theatre was offered him free of expense, one man buying one hundred tickets, and the admiring throng drew his carriage to the hotel, while the procession with torchlights acted as guard of honour. Ole Bull had stepped into the glory of fame in a single night. Henceforth, while there was to be much of trial and disappointment, as come to all, he was to be forever the idol of two continents, drawing crowded houses, honoured by the great, and universally mourned at his death. He had come to fame as by accident, but he had made himself worthy of fame. Malibran at first seemed hurt at his wonderful success in her stead, but she soon became one of his warmest friends, saying, It is your own fault that I did not treat you as you deserved. A man like you should step forth with head erect in the full light of day, that we may recognize his noble blood. From here he played with great success at Florence and Rome, at the latter city composing his celebrated Polaccia Guerra in a single night, riding till four o'clock in the morning. It was first conceived while he stood alone at Naples, at midnight, watching Mount Vesuvius aflame. Returning to Paris, he found the grand opera open to him. Here, at his first performance, his A-string snapped. He turned deathly pale, but he transposed the remainder of the piece and finished it on three strings. Meyerbeer, who was present, could not believe it possible that the string had really broken. He was now twenty-six, famous and above want. What more fitting than he should marry pretty Felice Villamanot, and share with her the precious life she had saved? They were married in the summer of 1836, and their love was a beautiful and enduring one until her death twenty-six years afterward. Though absent from her much of the time necessarily, his letters breathe a pure and ardent affection. Going to England soon after, and being at the house of the Duke of Devonshire at Chatsworth, he writes, how long does the time seem that deprives me of seeing you? I embrace you tenderly. The word home has above all others the greatest charm for me. In London, from three to seven thousand persons crowded to hear him. The Times said, his command of the instrument, from the top to the bottom of the scale, and he has a scale of his own of three complete octaves on each string, is absolutely perfect. At Liverpool he received four thousand dollars for a single night, taking the place of Malibran, who had brought on a hemorrhage resulting in death by forcing a tone, and holding it so long that the audience were astonished. Ole Bull came near to sharing her fate. In playing Polaccia, the hall being large and the orchestra too strong, he ruptured a blood vessel, and his coat had to be cut from him. In sixteen months he gave two hundred and seventy-four concerts in the United Kingdom. Afterwards, at St. Petersburg, he played to five thousand persons, the emperor sending him an autograph letter of affection, and the empress an emerald ring set with one hundred and forty diamonds. Shortly after this his father died, speaking with pride of Oli, and thinking he heard divine music. On his return to Norway, at the request of the king, he gave five concerts at Stockholm, the last netting him five thousand dollars. So moved was the king when Oli Bull played before him at the palace, that he rose and stood till the palacha was finished. He presented the artist with the order of Vasa, set in brilliance. In Christiana, the students gave him a public dinner, and crowned him with laurel. He often played for the peasants here and in Bergen, and was beloved by the poor as by the rich. At Copenhagen he was presented at court, the king giving him a snuff-box set in diamonds. Hans Andersen became his devoted friend, as did Thorwaldsen while he was in Rome. He now went to Cassel and Sofer hastened to show him every attention, as though to make amends for the coldness when Ole Bull was poor and unknown. At Salzburg he invited the wife of Mozart to his concerts. For her husband he had surprising admiration. He used to say that no mortal could write Mozart's Requiem and live. While in Hungary, his first child, Ole, died. He wrote his wife, God knows how much I have suffered. I still hope and work not for myself, for you, my family, my country, my Norway, of which I am proud. All this time he was working very hard. He said, I must correspond with the directors of the theatres, must obtain information regarding the people with whom I am to deal. I must make my appointments for concerts and rehearsals, have my music copied, correct the scores, compose, play, travel nights, 
I am always cheated, and in everlasting trouble. I reproach myself when everything does not turn out for the best, and am consumed with grief. I really believe I should succumb to all these demands and fatigues if it were not for my drinking cold water and bathing in it every morning and evening. In November, 1843, urged by Fanny Elser, he visited America. At first, in New York, some of the prominent violinists opposed him, but he steadily made his way. When Mr. James Gordon Bennett offered him the columns of the Herald that he might reply to those who were assailing him, he said in his broken English, I think, Mr. Bennett, it is best to writes against me, and I plays against them. Of his playing in New York, Mrs. Lydia Maria Child wrote, His bow touched the strings as if in sport, and brought forth light leaps of sound, with electric rapidity, yet clear in their distinctness. He played on four strings at once, and produced the rich harmony of four instruments. While he was playing, the rustling of a leaf might have been heard, and when he closed, the tremendous bursts of applause told how the hearts of thousands leaped like one. His first audience were beside themselves with delight, and the orchestra threw down their instruments in ecstatic wonder. From New York he took a successful trip south. That he was not effeminate, while deeply poetic, a single incident will show. After a concert, a man came to him and said he wished the diamond in his violin bow, given him by the Duke of Devonshire. Ole Bull replied that as it was a gift, he could neither sell it nor give it away. "'But I'm going to have that stone,' said the man, as he drew a bowie knife from his coat. In an instant, Ole Bull had felled the man to the floor with the edge of his hand across his throat. "'The next time I would kill you,' said the musician, with his foot on the man's chest. "'But you may go now.' So much did the ruffian admire the muscle and skill of the artist that he begged him to accept the knife which he had intended to use upon him. During this visit to America he gave two hundred concerts, netting him, said the New York Herald, fully eighty thousand dollars, besides twenty thousand given to charitable associations, and fifteen thousand paid to assistant artists. No artist has ever visited our country and received so many honors. Poems by the hundreds have been written to him, gold vases, pencils, medals, have been presented to him by various corporations. His whole remarkable appearance in this country is really unexampled in glory and fame, said the newspaper. Ole Bull was kindness itself to the sick or afflicted. Now he played for Alice and Phoebe Carey, when unable to leave their home, and now for insane and blind asylums, and at hospitals. He loved America, and called himself her adopted son. On his return to Norway, after great success in Spain, the Queen bestowing upon him the Order of Charles the Third, and the Portuguese Order of Christus, he determined to build a national theatre in Bergen, his birthplace, for the advancement of his nation in the drama and in music. By great energy, and the bestowal of a large sum of money, the place was opened in 1850, Ole Bull leading the orchestra. But the Strothing, or Parliament, declined to give it a yearly appropriation, Perhaps the development of home talent tended too strongly toward republicanism. The burden was too great for one man to carry, and the project did not prove a success. The next plan of the philanthropist musician was to buy 125,000 acres of land on the Susquehanna River in Pennsylvania, and found a new Norway, consecrated to liberty, baptized with independence, and protected by the Union's mighty flag. Soon three hundred houses were built, a country inn, store, and church, erected by the founder. To pay the thousands needed for this enterprise, he worked constantly at concert-giving, taking scarcely time to eat his meals. He laid out five new villages, made arrangements with the government to cast cannon for her fortresses, and took out patents for a new smelting furnace. While in California, where he was ill with yellow fever, a crushing blow fell upon him. He learned that he had purchased the land through a swindling company, his title was invalid, and his fortune was lost. He could only buy enough land to protect those who had already come from Norway and had settled there, and soon became deeply involved in lawsuits. The Honorable E. W. Stoughton of New York, who had never met Ole Bull personally, volunteered to assist him, and a few thousands were wrested from the defrauding agent. On his return to Norway, he was accused of speculating with the funds of his countrymen, which cut him to the heart. A little later, in 1862, his wife died, worn with ill health and with her husband's misfortunes, and his son Thorvald, 
fell from the mast of a sailing vessel in the Mediterranean and was killed. In the autumn of 1868 he returned to America, and nearly lost his life in a steamboat collision on the Ohio. He swam to land, saving also his precious violin. Two years afterward he was married to Miss Thorpe of Madison, Wisconsin, an accomplished lady much his junior in years, who has lived to write an admirable life of her illustrious husband. A daughter, Olia, came to gladden his home two years later. When he was sixty-six years old, he celebrated his birthday by playing his violin on the top of the great pyramid, Cheops, at the suggestion of King Oscar of Norway and Sweden. In the centennial year he returned to America and made his home at Cambridge in the house of James Russell Lowell while he was minister to England. Here he enjoyed the friendship of such as Longfellow, who says of him in his Tales of a Wayside Inn, The angel with the violin, painted by Raphael, he seemed. And when he played, the atmosphere was filled with magic, and the ear caught echoes of that harp of gold, whose music has so weird a sound, the hunted stag forgot to bound, the leaping rivulet backwards rolled, the birds came down from bush and tree, the dead came from beneath the sea, the maiden to the harper's knee. The friend of the highest, he never forgot the lowest. When a colored barber in Hartford, a lad who was himself a good fiddler, heard Ole Bull play, the latter having sent him a ticket to his concert, he said, Mister, can't you come down to the shop tomorrow to get shaved and show me those tricks? I feel powerful bad. And Ole Bull went to the shop and showed him how the wonderful playing was accomplished. In 1880 Ole Bull sailed, for the last time, to Europe, to his lovely home at Lyso, an island in the sea eighteen miles from Bergen. Ill on the voyage, he was thankful to reach the cherished place. Here, planned by his own hand, was his elegant home overlooking the ocean. Here his choice music-room, upheld by delicate columns and curiously wrought arches. Here the shell-rooms he had built, and here the flower-beds he had planted. The end came soon, on a beautiful day full of sunshine. The body lay in state in the great music-room, till a large steamer came to bear it to Bergen. This was met by a convoy of sixteen steamers, ranged on either side and as the fleet approached the city, all flags were at half-mast, and guns were fired, which re-echoed through the mountains. The quay was covered with juniper, and the whole front festooned with green. As the boat touched the shore, one of Ole Bull's inimitable melodies was played. Young girls dressed in black bore the trophies of his success, and distinguished men carried his gold crown and order in the procession. The streets were strewn with flowers, and showered upon the coffin. When the service had been read at the grave by the pastor, Bjornsson, the famous author, gave an address. After the coffin had been lowered and the mourners had departed, hundreds of peasants came, bringing a green bough, a sprig of fern, or a flower, and quite filled the grave. Beautiful tribute to a beautiful life. End of chapter 24《ハッピーバーベキュー》ですこれは、ファミリーバーベキューの皆さんが有名なのです。ファミリーバーベキューの皆さんが有名なのです。ファミリーバーベキューの皆さんが有名なのです。ファミリーバーベキューの皆さんが有名なのです。ファミリーバーベキューの皆さんが有名なのです。ファミリーバーベキューの皆さんが有名なのです。ファミリーバーベキューの皆さんが有名なのです。ファミリーバーベキューの皆さんが有名なのです。ファミリーバーベキューの皆さんが有名なのです。ファミリーバーベキューの皆さんが有名なのです。ファミリーバーベキューの皆さんが有名なのです。ファミリーバーベキュー has had fit illustration in Messonnier. He has been a life of constant, unvaried toil. He came to Paris a poor, unknown boy, and has worked over fifty years till he stands a master in French art. Jean-Louis Ernest Messonnier was born at Lyon in 1811. His early life was passed in poverty so grinding that the great artist never speaks of it, and in such obscurity that scarcely anything is known of his boyhood. At nineteen he came to Paris to try his fate in one of the great centers of the world. He, of course, found no open doors, nobody standing ready to assist genius. Genius must ever open doors for itself. The lad was a close observer, and had learned to draw accurately. 
he could give every variety of costume and express almost any emotion in the face of his subject. But he was unknown. He might do good work, but nobody wanted it. He used to paint by the side of de Bonnier in the Louvre, it is said, for one dollar a yard. Now his Amateurs in Painting, a chef de voix of six inches in size, is bought by Leon Say for six thousand dollars. Such is fame. Time was so necessary in this struggle for bread that he could sleep only every other night, and for six months his finances were so low, it is stated, that he existed on ten cents a week. No wonder that the sorrows of those days are never mentioned. His earliest work was painting the tops of bonbon boxes and fans. Once he grew brave enough to take four little sepia drawings to an editor to illustrate a fairy tale in a magazine for children. The editor said the drawings were charming, but he could not afford to have them engraved, and so returned them with thanks. His first illustrations in some unknown journal were scenes from the life of The Old Bachelor. In the first picture he is represented making his toilet before the mirror, his wig spread out on the table, in the second, dining with two friends, in the third, being abused by his housekeeper, in the fourth, on his deathbed, surrounded by greedy relations, and in the fifth, the servants ransacking the death chamber for the property. For a universal history he drew figures of Isaiah, St. Paul, and Charlemagne, besides almost numberless ornamental letters and headings of chapters. Of course he longed for more remunerative work, for fame, but he must plod on for months yet. He worked conscientiously, taking the greatest pains with every detail. His first picture, exhibited in 1833, when he was twenty-two, called The Visitors, an interior view of a house, with an old gentleman receiving two visitors, all dressed in the costume of James I, admirable for its light and shade, was bought by the Society of the Friends of Art for twenty dollars. Two years later, he made illustrations of the Bible for this year remand, of Holofernes invading Judea, and Judith appearing before Holofernes. For Paul and Virginia, he made forty-three beautiful landscapes. They contain evidence of long and careful work in the hothouses of the Jardin de Plantes, and in the front of the old bric-a-brac dealer's stalls, which used to stand about the entrance to the Louvre, and how admirably, with the help of these slowly and scrupulously finished studies, could he reproduce, in an ornamental letter or floral ornament, a lily broken by the storm, or a sheaf of Indian arms and musical instruments. In 1836, his Chess Players, Two Men Watching Intently the Moves of Chess, and The Little Messenger, attracted a crowd of admirers, each sold for twenty dollars. He had now struggled for six years in Paris. It was high time that his unremitting and patient work should find approval. The people were amazed at so vast an amount of labor in so small a space. They looked with their magnifying glasses and found the work exquisite in detail. They had been accustomed to great canvases, glowing colors, and heroic or romantic sentiments, but here there was wonderful workmanship. When the people began to admire, critics began to criticize. They said, Moussonnier can depict home-like or ordinary scenes, but not historic. He said nothing, but soon brought out Diderot among the philosophers, Grimm, D'Alembert, Baron Holbach, and others in the seventeenth century. Then they said he can draw interiors only, and on canvas not much larger than his thumbnail. He soon produced the portrait of the sergeant, one of the most daring experiments in the painting of light in modern art. The man stands out there in the open by himself, literally bathed in light, and he makes a perfect picture. Then they were sure that he could not paint movement. He replied by painting Rixi, two ruffians who are striving to fight, but are withheld by friends. This was given by Louis Napoleon to the prince consort. Meissonier also showed that he could depict great scenes, by Moreau and de Soils on the eve of the Battle of Hohenlinden, the retreat from Russia, and the emperor as Solferino. Into these he put his admiration for Napoleon the Great, and his adoration for his defeated country. In the former picture, the two generals are standing on a precipice, surveying the snow-covered battlefield with a glass. The trees are bending under a strong wind, and the cloaks of the generals are fluttering behind them. 
one feels the power of this picture. In painting The Retreat from Russia, the artist borrowed the identical coat worn by Napoleon and had it copied, crease for crease and button for button. When I painted that picture, he said, I executed a great portion of it out of doors. It was midwinter, and the ground was covered with snow. Sometimes I sat at my easel for five or six hours together, endeavoring to seize the exact aspect of the winter atmosphere. My servant placed a hot foot-stove under my feet, which he renewed from time to time, but I used to get half-frozen and terribly tired. He had a wooden horse made in imitation of the white charger of the emperor, and seating himself on this, he studied his own figure in a mirror. His studies for this picture were almost numberless, a horse's head, an uplifted leg, cuirasses, helmets, models of horses in red wax, etc. He also prepared a miniature landscape, strewn with white powder resembling snow, with models of heavy wheels running through it, that he might study the furrow made in that terrible march home from burning Moscow. All this was work, hard, patient, exacting work. It had now become evident to the world, and to the critics as well, that Meissonier was a master, that he was not confined to small canvases, nor home scenes. In 1855 he received the Grand Medal. In 1856 he was made an officer of the Legion of Honor. In 1861 a member of the Institute. And in 1867, at the International Exhibition, he received the Grand Medal again. When the prizes were given by the Emperor, the Battle of Soferino was placed in the center of the space cleared for the ceremony, with the works of Reimers, the Russian painter, Naus of Prussia, Rousseau, the French landscape painter, and others. This painting represents Napoleon III in front of his staff, looking upon the battle as a cool chess player studies a chessboard. On the right, in the foreground, some artillerymen are maneuvering their guns. The corpses of a French soldier and two white Austrians torn to rags by some explosion, show where the battle has passed by. Meissonier's paintings now brought enormous prices. His Marshal Saxe and his staff brought $8,600 in New York. The soldiers at Cards in 1876, in the same city, $11,500. In 1867, his Cavalry Charge was sold to Mr. Probasco of Cincinnati for $30,000, and the Battlefield of Friedland, upon which he is said to have worked for fifteen years, to A. T. Stewart of New York for sixty thousand dollars. Every figure in this was drawn from life, and the horses molded in wax. It represents Napoleon on horseback, on a slight elevation, his marshals grouped around him, holding aloft his cocked hat in salutation, as the soldiers pass hurriedly before him. Edmund About once wrote, to cover Monsieur Monseigneur's pictures with gold pieces would simply be to buy them for nothing, and the practice has now been established of covering them with banknotes. The blacksmith, shoeing a patient old cart horse, perfect in anatomy. La Halt, some soldiers at an inn, now in Hentford House Gallery, and La Barricade, a souvenir of the Civil War, are among the favorite pictures of this famous man. And yet, as one looks at some of the exquisite work about a convivial scene, the words of the great Boston painter, William Hunt, come to mind. Being shown a picture, very fine in technique, by a Munich artist of a drunken man holding a half-filled glass of wine, he said, It is skillfully done, but what is the use of doing it? The subject isn't worthy of the painter. Rarely does a woman appear in Messonnier's pictures. He has done nothing to deprave morals, which is more than can be said of some French art. His portrait of Madame Henri Tenard was greatly admired, while that of Mrs. Mackay was not satisfactory, and was said to have been destroyed by her. Few persons, however, can afford to destroy a Messonnier. When told once that he was a fortunate man, as he could possess as many Messonniers as he pleased, he replied, No, no, I cannot. That would ruin me. They are a great deal too dear. He lives in the Boulevard Marchabelle, near the lovely Parc Mansion, in the heart of the artist quarter in Paris. His handsome home, designed by himself in every detail, is of the Italian Renaissance style. He has two studies, one a quiet nook where he can escape interruptions, and one very large where are gathered masterpieces from every part of the world. 
Here is a courtyard in the time of Louis the Thirteenth, brilliantly crowded with figures in gala dress, a bride of the same period, stepping into an elegant carriage of a crimson color, for which Meissonier had a miniature model built by a coachmaker to study from. A superb work of Titian, a figure of an Italian woman in a robe of green velvet, the classic outline of her head shown against a crimson velvet curtain in the background. A sketch of Bonaparte on horseback, at the head of his picturesquely dressed staff, reviewing the young conscripts of the army of Italy, who are cheering as he passes, and many more valuable pictures. Here, too, are bridles of black leather, with silver ornaments, once the property of Murat. One picture here, of a special interest, was painted at his summer house at Poissy, when his house was crowded with German soldiers in the War of 1871. To escape their company, says Monsieur Clerty, in the rage that he experienced at the national defeat, he shut himself up in his studio, and threw upon the canvas the most striking, the most vivid, the most avenging of allegories. He painted Paris, enveloped in a veil of mourning, defending herself against the enemy, with her soldiers and her dying grouped round a tattered flag, sailors, officers, and fusiliers, soldiers, national guards, suffering women, and dying children. And, hovering in the air above them, with a Prussian eagle by her side, was famine, wan and haggard famine, accomplishing the work that the bombardment had failed to achieve. His summer home, like the one in Paris, is fitted up luxuriously. He designed most of the furniture and the silver service for his table. Flowers, especially geraniums and tea roses, blossom in profusion about the grounds, while great trees and fountains make it a restful and inviting place. The walls of the dining room are hung with crimson and gold satin damask, against which are several of his own pictures. An engraver at work, clad in a red dressing gown, and seated in a room hung with ancient tapestry, has the face of his son Charles, also an artist, looking out from the frame. One of Madame Messonnier also adorns this room. Nearby are his well-filled stables, his favorite horse, Rivoli, being often used for his model. He is equally fond of dogs, and has several expensive hounds. How strange all this, compared with those early days of pinching poverty. He is rarely seen in public, because he has learned, what, alas, some people learn too late in life, that there is no success without one commands his or her time. It must be frittered away neither by calls nor parties, neither by idle talk nor useless visits. Painting or writing for an hour a day never made greatness. Art and literature will give no masterships except to devotees. The young lady, sauntering down to look at ribbons, never makes a George Eliot. The young man, sauntering down to look at the buyers of ribbons, never makes a Messonnier. Nature is rigid in her laws. Her gifts only grow to fruitage in the hands of workers. Meissonier is now seventy-four, with long gray beard and hair, round, full face, and bright hazel eyes. His friend, Clerty, says of him, This man, who lives in a palace, is as moderate as a soldier on the march. This artist, whose canvases are valued by the half-million, is as generalist as an abob. He will give to a charity sale a picture worth the price of a house. Praised as he is by all, he has less conceit in his nature than a wholesale painter. January 31, 1891, at his home in Paris, the great artist passed away. His illness was very brief. The funeral services took place at the Church of the Madeleine, which was thronged with the leaders of art and letters. An imposing military cortege accompanied the body to its last resting place at Poissy, the summer home of the artist, on the Seine, ten miles from Versailles. End of chapter 25《Chapter 26 of Lives of Poor Boys Who Became Famous》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Smith — Lives of Poor Boys Who Became Famous — by Sarah Knowles Bolton — Chapter 26 — George W. Childs — The Public Ledger of Philadelphia and its owner are known the world over, but we see the large-hearted, hospitable millionaire who has come to honor through his own industry. Let us enter the elegant building occupied by his newspaper. Every portion is interesting. The rooms where editors and assistants work are large, light, and airy, and as tasteful as parlors, 
Alas, how unhomelike and barren are some of the newspaper offices where gifted men toil from morning till night, with little time for sleep and still less for recreation. Mr. Childs has thought of the comfort and health of his workmen, for he too was a poor boy and knows what it is to labor. He has also been generous with his men in the matter of wages. He refused to reduce the rate of payment of his compositors, notwithstanding that the typographical union had formally sanctioned a reduction, and notwithstanding that the reduced scale was operative in every printing office in Philadelphia except his own. He said, My business is prosperous. Why should not my man share in my prosperity? The act of graciousness, while it endeared him to the hearts of his beneficiaries, was commented on most favorably at home and abroad, that his employees, in a formal interview with him, expressed their willingness to accept the reduced rates, simply augments the generosity of his act. Strikes among laborers would be few and far between if employers were like George W. Childs. Each person in his employ has a summer vacation of two or more weeks, his wages being continued meantime and paid in advance, with a liberal sum besides. On Christmas, every man, woman, and boy receives a present amounting, of course, to many thousands of dollars annually. Mr. Childs has taken care of many who have become old or disabled in his service. The foreman of his composing room had worked for him less than 12 months before he failed in health. For years, this man has drawn his weekly pay, though never going to the establishment. This is indeed practical Christianity. Besides caring for the living, in 1868, this wise employer of labor purchased 2,000 feet in woodlands for a printer's cemetery and gave it to the Philadelphia Typographical Society with a sum of money to keep the grounds in good order yearly. The first person buried beyond the handsome marble Gothic gateway was a destitute, an aged printer who had died at the almshouse and whose dying message to Mr. Childs was that he could not bear to fill a pauper's grave. His wish was cordially granted. But after seeing the admirable provision made for his workmen, we must enter the private office of Mr. Childs. He is most accessible to all, with no airs of superior position, welcoming persons from every clime daily. Between the hours of eleven and one, he listens courteously to any requests, and then bids you make yourself at home in this elegant office that certainly has no superior in the world, perhaps no rival. The room itself in the Queen Anne style with exquisite wood carving marble tiles brass ornaments, and painted glass, is a gem. Here is his motto, a noble one, and thoroughly American. Nil sin labor, and well his life has illustrated it. All honor to every man or woman who helps to make labor honored in this country. The design of the ceiling was suggested by a room in Coombe Bay Abbey, Warwickshire, the seat of the Earl's Craven. Fitted up by one of its lords, for the reception of Queen Elizabeth, over a dozen valuable clocks are seen, one made in Amsterdam over 200 years ago, which besides the time of day gives the phases of the moon, the days of the week, and the month. Another clock constructed by David Rittenhouse, the astronomer of the revolution in the old colonial days, which plays a great variety of music, has a little planetarium attached and nearly 6,000 teeth and wheels. It was made for Joseph Potts, who paid $640 for it. The Spanish minister in 1778 offered 800 for it, that he might present it to his sovereign. Mr. Childs has about 50 rare clocks in his various homes, one of these costing $6,000. Here is a marble statuette of Savonarola, the Florentine preacher of the 15th century. The little green harp, which belonged to Tom Moore and on which he used to play in the homes of the great, a colossal suite of antique French armor, 150 years old. A miniature likeness of George Washington, handsomely encased in gold, bequeathed by him to a relative. A lock of his hair in the back of the picture. A miniature ship made from the wood of the Alliance frigate, the only one of her first navy, of the class of frigates which escaped capture or destruction during the Revolutionary War. This boat and a silver waiter presented after the famous Battle of New Orleans, were both the property of President Jackson and were taken by him to the Hermitage. Here also is a photograph of old Ironside Stewart in a frame made from the Frigate Constitution in which great victories were achieved. 
besides many portraits given by famous people with their autographs. After a delightful hour spent in looking at these choice things, Mr. Childs bids us take our choice of some rare china cups and saucers. We choose one dainty with red birds and carry it away as a pleasant remembrance of a princely giver in a princely apartment. Mr. Childs has had a most interesting history. Born in Baltimore, he entered the United States Navy at 13, where he remained for 15 months. At 14, he came to Philadelphia, poor, but with courage and a quick mind, and found a place to work in a bookstore. Here, he remained for four years, doing his work faithfully and to the best of his ability. At the end of these years, he had saved a few hundred dollars and opened a little store for himself in the Ledger Building, where the well-known newspaper, The Public Ledger, was published. He was ambitious, as who is not, that comes to prominence. And one day he made the resolution that he would sometime be the owner of this great paper and its building. Probably had this resolution been known, his acquaintances would have regarded the youth as a little less than crazy. But the boy who willed this had a definite aim. Besides, he was never idle. He was economical. His habits were the best. And why should not such a boy succeed? In three years, when he was 21, he had become the head of a publishing house, Shields and Peterson. He had a keen sense of what the public needed. He brought out Kane's Arctic Expedition, from which the author, Dr. Kane, realized $70,000 200,000 copies of Peterson's Familiar Science were sold. Alibone dedicated his great work, Dictionary of English and American Authors, to the energetic and appreciative young publisher. He had now acquired wealth sooner almost than he could have hoped. Before him were bright prospects as a publisher, but the prize that he had set out to win was to own the public ledger. The opportunity came in December 1864, but his paper was losing money. His friends advised against taking such a burden. He would surely fail, but Mr. Childs had faith in himself. He expected to win where others lost. He bought the property, doubled the subscription rates, lowered the advertising, excluded everything questionable from the columns of his paper, made his editorials brief yet comprehensive, until under his judicious management, the journal reached a large circulation of 90,000 daily. For 10 years, he has given the ledger almanac to every subscriber, costing $5,000 annually. The yearly profits, it is stated, have been $400,000. All this has not been accomplished without thought and labor. Fortune, of course, had come. and fame, he built homes, elegant ones, in Philadelphia and at Newport. But these are not simply places in which to spend money, but centers of hospitality and culture. His library is one of the most charming places in this country. The woodwork is carved ebony with gold. The bookshelves six feet high on every side, and the ceiling built in sunken panels, blue and gold. In the center is a table made from ebony brought from Africa by Paul du Chalou. One looks who, with interest upon the handsome volumes of the standard authors, but other things are of deeper interest. Here is an original sermon of Reverend Cotton Mather, the poems of Leah Hunt, which he presented to Charles Dickens, the original manuscript of Nathaniel Hawthorne's Consular Experiences, the first edition of the Scarlet Letter, with a note to Mr. Childs from the great novelist Bryant's manuscript of the first book of the Illad, James Russell Lowell's June Idol, began in 1850 and finished 18 years afterward. The manuscript of James Finemore Cooper's Life of Captain Richard Summers and Edgar Allan Poe's Murders in the Rue Morgue, 17 pages of large paper written small and close. Here's an autograph letter from Poe in which he offers to his publishers 33 short stories, enough to fill two large volumes on the terms which you allowed me before, that is, you receive all profits and allow me 20 copies for distribution to friends. From this, it seems that Poe had the usual struggles of literary people. One of the most unique things in the library is the manuscript of our mutual friend, found in fine brown Morocco. The skeleton of the novel is written through several pages, showing how carefully Dickens thought out his plan 
and his characters. The paper is light blue, written over with dark blue ink, with many erasures and changes. Here are also 56 volumes of Dickinson's work, with an autograph letter in each, from the author to Mr. Childs. Here is Lord Byron's desk on which he wrote Don Juan. Now we look upon the smallest book ever printed, Dante's Divina Commedia, bound in turkey gilt, less than two and one-fourth inches long by one and one-half inches wide. The collection of Mr. and Mrs. S.C. Hall, now the property of Mr. Childs, letters and manuscripts from Lamb Hawthorne, Mary Somerville, Harriet Marinitu, Coleridge, Woodsworth, Browning, and hundreds of others is of almost priceless value. In 1879, Miss Hall gave the Bible of Tom Moore to Mr. Childs, an honored and much-loved citizen of the United States, as the best and most valuable offering she could make to him as a grateful tribute of respect, regard, and esteem. Another valuable book is made up of the portraits of the presidents, with an autograph letter from each. Don Pedro Brazil sent in 1876 a work on his empire, with his picture and his autograph. George Peabody set for a full-length portrait for Mr. Childs. The album of Miss Childs contains the autographs of a great number of the leading men and women of the world. One could linger here for days, but we must see the lovely country seat called Wooten, some distance out from the city. The house is in Queen Anne style, surrounded by velvety lawns, a wealth of evergreen, and exquisite plants brought over from South America and Africa. The farm adjoining is a delight to see. Here is the dairy built of white flintstone, while the milk room has stained glass windows, as though it were a chapel. The beautiful grounds are open every Thursday to visitors. Here have been entertained the Duke and Duchess of Buckingham, the Duke of Sutherland, Lord Rousset, Lord Dufferin, Sir Stafford, Northcote, Herbert Spencer, John Waller, M.P. of the London Times, Dean Stanley, Thomas Hughes, Dickens, Grant, Everts, indeed the famous of two hemispheres. With all this elegance befitting royalty, Mr. Childs has been a constant and generous giver. For his own city, he was one of the foremost to secure Fairmont Park and helped originate the Zoological Gardens, the Pennsylvania Museum, and the School of Industrial Arts. He gave $10,000 for a centennial exposition. He has been one of General Grant's most generous helpers. Yet while doing for the great, he does not forget the unknown. He gives free excursions to poor children, a dinner annually to the newsboys, and aids hundreds who are in need of an education. He has placed a stained glass window in Westminster Abbey in commemoration of George Herbert and William Cowper given largely to a memorial window for Thomas More at Bronham, England, for a stone to mark Leah Hunt's resting place in Kensal Green and toward a monument for Poe. Mr. Childs has come to eminence by energy, integrity, and true faith in himself. He has also had a noble ambition and has worked towards it. He has proved to all other American boys that worth and honest dealing will win success in a greater or less degree. The well-known scientist, Professor Joseph Henry of the Smithsonian Institute, said Mr. Childs is a wonderful man. His ability to apply the power of money in advancing the well-being of his fellow men is unrivaled. He is naturally kind and sympathetic, and these generous feelings are exalted, not depressed by his success in accumulating a fortune. Like man in the classification of animals, he forms a genius in himself. He stands alone. There is not another in the wide world like him. Mr. Childs died at 3.01 a.m., February 3, 1894, from the effects of a stroke of paralysis sustained at the ledger office on January 18. He was nearly 65 years of age. He was buried on February 6 in the Drexel Mausoleum, the Woodland Cemetery, beside his lifelong friend. End of chapter 26. Recording by... John Smith. Chapter 27 of Lives of Poor Boys Who Became Famous. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. Lives of Poor Boys Who Became Famous by Sarah Knowles Bolton Dwight L. Moody There's no chance to get in there. There's six thousand persons inside, and two thousand outside. This was said to Dr. Magoon, president of Iowa College, and myself, after we had waited for nearly an hour outside of Spurgeon's Tabernacle, in London, in the hope of hearing Mr. Moody preach. Finally, probably through courtesy to Americans, we obtained seats. The six thousand in this great church were sitting as though spellbound. The speaker was a man in middle life, rugged, strong, and plain in dress and manner. His words were so simple that a child could understand them. Now tears came into the eyes of most of the audience, as he told some touching incident, and now faces grew sober as the people examined their own hearts under the searching words. There was no consciousness about the preacher, no wild gesture nor loud tone. Only one expression seemed applicable, a man in dead earnest. And who was this man whom thousands came to hear? Not a learned man, not a rich man, but one of the greatest evangelists the world has ever seen. Circumstances were all against him, but he conquered circumstances. Dwight Lyman Moody was born at Northfield, Massachusetts, February 5, 1837. His father, a stonemason and farmer, died when the boy was four years old, broken down with reverses in business. His mother was left with seven sons and two daughters, the eldest a boy of fifteen. What happened to this lad was well told by Mr. Moody a few years since. Soon after my father's death, the creditors came in and took everything. One calamity after another swept over the entire household. Twins were added to the family, and my mother was taken sick. To the eldest boy my mother looked as a stay in her calamity, but all at once that boy became a wanderer. He had been reading some of the trashy novels, and the belief had seized him that he had only to go away to make a fortune. Away he went. I can remember how eagerly she used to look for tidings of that boy, how she used to send us to the post office to see if there was a letter from him, and recollect how we used to come back with the sad news, no letter. I remember how in the evenings we used to sit beside her in that New England home, and we would talk about our father, but the moment the name of that boy was mentioned she would hush us into silence. Some nights, when the wind was very high, and the house, which was upon a hill, would tremble at every gust, the voice of my mother was raised in prayer for that wanderer who had treated her so unkindly. I used to think she loved him better than all of us put together, and I believe she did. On a Thanksgiving day she used to set a chair for him, thinking he would return home. Her family grew up, and her boys left home. When I got so that I could write, I sent letters all over the country, but could find no trace of him. One day, while in Boston, the news reached me that he had returned. While in that city, I remember how I used to look for him in every store. He had a mark on his face, but I never got any trace. One day, while my mother was sitting at the door, a stranger was seen coming toward the house, and when he came to the door he stopped. My mother didn't know her boy. He stood there with folded arms and great beard flowing down his breast, his tears trickling down his face. When my mother saw those tears, she cried, Oh, it's my lost son, and entreated him to come in. But he stood still. No, mother, he said, I will not come in until I hear that you have forgiven me. She rushed to the threshold, threw her arms around him, and breathed forgiveness. Dwight grew to be a strong, self-willed lad, working on the farm, fond of fun rather than of study, held in check only by his devotion to his mother. She was urged to put the children into different homes, on account of their extreme poverty. But by tilling their garden and doing some work for their neighbors, she managed to keep her little flock together. A woman who could do this had remarkable energy and courage. What little schooling Dwight received was not greatly enjoyed, because the teacher was a quick-tempered man who used a rattan on the boys' backs. Years after, he told how a happy change was effected in that school. After a while there was somebody who began to get up a movement in favor of controlling the school by love. 
I remember how we thought of the good time we should have that winter, when the rattan would be out of school. We thought how we would then have all the fun we wanted. I remember who the teacher was, a lady, and she opened the school with prayer. We hadn't seen it done before, and we were impressed, especially when she prayed that she might have grace and strength to rule the school with love. The school went on several weeks, and we saw no rattan, but at last the rules were broken, and I think I was the first boy to break them. She told me to wait till after school, and then she would see me. I thought the rattan was coming out sure, and stretched myself up in a warlike attitude. After school, however, she sat down by me and told me how she loved me, and how she had prayed to be able to rule that school by love, and concluded by saying, I want to ask you one favor, that is, if you love me, try and be a good boy, and I never gave her trouble again. He was very susceptible to kindness. When an old man, who had the habit of giving every new boy who came into town a cent, put his hand on Dwight's head, and told him he had a father in heaven, he never forgot the pressure of that old man's hand. Farming around Northfield Rocks was not exciting work enough for the energetic boy, so with his mother's consent he started for Boston, when he was seventeen, to look for work. He had the same bitter experience that other homeless boys have. He says, I went to the post office two or three times a day to see if there was a letter for me. I knew there was not, as there was but one mail a day. I had not any employment and was very homesick, and so went constantly to the post office, thinking perhaps when the mail did come in, my letter had been mislaid. At last, however, I got a letter. It was from my youngest sister, the first letter she ever wrote me. I opened it with a light heart, thinking there was some good news from home but the burden of the whole letter was that she had heard there were pickpockets in Boston, and warned me to take care of them. I thought I had better get some money in hand first, and then I might take care of pickpockets. The homesick boy finally applied to an uncle, a shoe dealer, who hesitated much about taking the country lad into his employ. He agreed to do so on the condition that the boy would heed his advice, and attend regularly the Mount Vernon Church and Sunday School. The preaching of Dr. Kirk, the pastor, was scholarly and eloquent, but quite above the lad's comprehension. His Sunday school teacher, Mr. Edward Kimball, was a devoted man, and withal had the tact to win a boy's confidence. One day he came into the store where young Moody worked, and going behind the counter, placed his hand on the boy's shoulder, and talked about his becoming a Christian. Such interest touched Dwight's heart, and he soon took a stand on the right side. Years afterward, Moody was the means of the conversion of the son of Mr. Kimball, at seventeen, just his own age at this time. His earnest nature made him eager to do Christian work, but so poor was his command of language, and his sentences were so awkward, that he was not accepted to the membership of the church for a year after he had made his application. They thought him unlikely to ever become a Christian of clear and decided views of gospel truth, still less to fill any extended sphere of public usefulness. Alas, how the best of us sometimes have our eyes shut to the treasures lying at our feet. He longed for a wider field of usefulness, and in the fall of 1856, when he was nineteen, started for Chicago, taking with him testimonials which secured him a place as salesman in a shoe store. He joined Plymouth Church, and at once rented four pews for the young men whom he intended to bring in. Here, it is said, some of the more cultured assured him that his silence would be more effective for good than his speech, certainly not encouraging to a young convert. He offered his services to a mission school as a teacher. He was welcome if he would bring his own scholars, they said. The next Sunday, to their astonishment, young Moody walked in at the head of eighteen ragged urchins whom he had gathered from the streets. He distributed tracts among the seamen at the wharfs, and did not fear to go into saloons and talk with the inmates. Finally, he wanted a larger field still, and opened an old saloon, which had been vacated, as a Sunday school room. It was in the neighborhood of two hundred saloons and gambling dens. His heart was full of love for the poor and the outcasts, and they did not mind about his grammar. A friend came to see him in these dingy quarters, and found him holding a colored child, while he read, by the dim light of some tallow candles, the story of the prodigal son to his little congregation. "'I've got only one talent,' said the unassuming Moody. "'I have no education, 
but I love the Lord Jesus Christ, and I want to do something for him. I want you to pray for me. Thirteen years later, when all Great Britain was aflame with the sermons of this same man, he wrote his friend, Pray for me every day. Pray now that the Lord will keep me humble. Soon the Sunday school outgrew the shabby saloon and was moved to a hall, where a thousand scholars gathered. Still attending to the business as a traveling salesman, for six years he swept and made ready his Sunday school room. He had great tact with his pupils and won them by kindness. One day a boy came, who was very unruly, sticking pins into the backs of the other boys. Mr. Moody patted him kindly on the head and asked him to come again. After a short time he became a Christian, and then was anxious about his mother, whom Mr. Moody had been unable to influence. One night the lad threw his arms about her neck, and weeping told her how he had stopped swearing, and how he wanted her to love the Saviour. When she passed his room she heard him praying, O oh God, convert my dear mother. The next Sunday he led her into the Sabbath school, and she became an earnest worker. He also had great tact with his young converts. Every man can do something, he says. I had a Swede converted in Chicago. I don't know how. I don't suppose he was converted by my sermons, because he couldn't understand much. The Lord converted him into one of the happiest men you ever saw. His face shone all over. He came to me, and he had to speak through an interpreter. This interpreter said this Swede wanted to have me give him something to do, and I said to myself, what in the world will I set this man doing? He can't talk English. So I gave him a bundle of little handbills, and put him out on the corner of the greatest thoroughfare of Chicago, and let him give them out, inviting people to come and hear me preach. A man would come along and take it, and see gospel meeting, and would then turn around and curse this fellow. But the Swede would laugh, because he didn't know but he was blessing him. He couldn't tell the difference. A great many men were impressed by that man's being so polite and kind. There he stood, and when winter came and the nights got so dark they could not read those little handbills, he went and got a little transparency, and put it up on the corner, and there he took his stand, hot or cold, rain or shine. Many a man was won to Christ by his efforts. In 1860, when Moody was twenty-three, he made up his mind to give all his time to Christian work. He was led to do this by the following incident. He says, in the Sunday school I had a pale, delicate young man as one of the teachers. I knew his burning piety, and assigned him to the worst class in the school. They were all girls, and it was an awful class. They kept gadding around in the schoolroom, and were laughing and carrying on all the while. One Sunday he was absent, and I tried myself to teach the class, but couldn't do anything with them. They seemed farther off than ever from any concern about their souls. Well, the day after his absence, Early Monday morning, the young man came into the store where I worked, and, tottering and bloodless, threw himself down on some boxes. "'What's the matter?' I asked. "'I have been bleeding at the lungs, and they have given me up to die,' he said. "'But you are not afraid to die?' I questioned. "'No,' said he. "'I am not afraid to die. But I have got to stand before God and give an account of my stewardship, and not one of my Sabbath school scholars has been brought to Jesus.' I have failed to bring one, and haven't any strength to do it now. He was so weighed down that I got a carriage and took that dying man in it, and we called at the homes of every one of his scholars, and to each one he said, as best his faint voice would let him, I have come to just ask you to come to the Saviour, and then he prayed as I never heard before. And for ten days he labored in that way, sometimes walking to the nearest houses, and at the end of that ten days, every one of that large class had yielded to the Saviour. Full well I remember the night before he went away, for the doctors said he must hurry to the south, how we held a true love feast. It was the very gate of heaven, that meeting. He prayed, and they prayed. He didn't ask them, he didn't think they could pray, and then we sung, Blessed be the tie that binds. It was a beautiful night in June that he left on the Michigan Southern, and I was down to the train to help him off. And those girls, every one gathered there again, all unknown to each other, and the depot seemed a second gate to heaven in the joyful yet tearful communion and farewells between these newly redeemed souls and him whose crown of rejoicing it would be that he led them to Jesus. At last the gong sounded, and, 
Supported on the platform, the dying man shook hands with each one, and whispered, I will meet you yonder. From this, says Mr. Moody, I got the first impulse to work solely for the conversion of men. When he told his employer that he was going to give up business, he was asked, Where will you get your support? God will provide for me if he wishes me to keep on, and I shall keep on till I am obliged to stop, was the reply. To keep his expenses as low as possible, he slept at night on a hard bench in the rooms of the Young Men's Christian Association, and ate the plainest food. Thus was the devoted work of this Christian hero begun. He was soon made city missionary for a time. Then the Civil War began, and a camp was established near Chicago. He saw his wonderful opportunity now to reach men who were soon to be face to face with death. The first tent erected was used as a place of prayer. Ministers and friends came to his aid. He labored day and night, sometimes eight or ten prayer meetings being held at the same time in the various tents. He did not desert the men on the field of battle. He was with the army at Pittsburgh Landing, Shiloh, Murfreesboro, and Chattanooga. Nine times, in the interests of the Christian Commission, he visited our men at the front on his errands of mercy. He tells this incident in a hospital at Murfreesboro. One night, after midnight, I was woke up and told that there was a man in one of the wards who wanted to see me. I went to him, and he called me chaplain. I wasn't a chaplain. And he said he wanted me to help him die. And I said, I'd take you right up in my arms and carry you into the kingdom of God, if I could. But I can't do it. I can't help you to die. And he said, Who can? I said, The Lord Jesus Christ can. He came for that purpose. He shook his head and said, He can't save me. I've sinned all my life. And I said, But he came to save sinners. I thought of his mother in the north, and I knew that she was anxious that he should die right, and I thought I'd stay with him. I prayed two or three times, and repeated all the promises I could, and I knew that in a few hours he would be gone. I said I wanted to read him a conversation that Christ had with a man who was anxious about his soul. I turned to the third chapter of John, his eyes were riveted upon me, and when I came to the fourteenth and fifteenth verses, he caught up the words, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. He stopped me, and said, Is that there? I said, Yes, and he asked me to read it again, and I did so. He leaned his elbows on the cot, and clasped his hands together, and said, That's good. Won't you read it again? I read it the third time, and then went on with the rest of the chapter. When I finished, his eyes were closed, his hands were folded, and there was a smile on his face. Oh, how it was lit up! What a change had come over it! I saw his lips quiver, and I leaned over him and heard a faint whisper. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have eternal life. He opened his eyes and said, That's enough. Don't read any more. He lingered a few hours, and then pillowed his head on those two verses, and went up in one of Christ's chariots, and took his seat in the kingdom of God. On the 28th of August, 1862, Mr. Moody married Miss Emma C. Revel, a most helpful assistant in his meetings, and a young lady of noble character. A daughter and a son came to gladden their simple cottage, and there was no happier home in all Chicago. One morning he said to his wife, I have no money, and the house is without supplies. It looks as if the Lord had had enough of me in this mission work, and is going to send me back again to sell boots and shoes. But very soon two checks came, one of fifty dollars for himself, and another for his school. Six years after his marriage, his friends gave him the lease of a pleasant, furnished house. This home had a welcome for all who sought the true way to live. One day a gentleman called at the office, bringing a young man who had recently come out of the penitentiary. The latter shrunk from going into the office, but Mr. Moody said, Bring him in. Mr. Moody took him by the hand, told him he was glad to see him, and invited him to his house. When the young man called, Mr. Moody introduced him as his friend. When his little daughter came into the room, he said, Emma, this is Papa's friend. She went up and kissed him, and the man sobbed aloud. 
When she left the room, Mr. Moody said, What is the matter? Oh, sir, was the reply, I have not had a kiss for years. The last kiss I had was from my mother, and she was dying. I thought I would never have another kiss again. No wonder people are saved by visiting a home like this. In 1863, those who had been converted under this beloved leader wanted a church of their own, where they could worship together. A building was erected, costing $20,000. Four years later, Mr. Moody was made president of Young Men's Christian Association, and Farwell House was speedily built. He was loved and honored everywhere. Once he was invited to the opening of a great billiard hall. He saw the owners and asked if he might bring a friend. They said yes, but asked who he was. Mr. Moody said it wasn't necessary to tell, but he never went without him. They understood his meaning and said, Come, we don't want any praying. You've given me an invitation, and I am going to come, he replied. But if you come, you needn't pray. Well, I'll tell you what we'll do, was the answer. We'll compromise the matter, and if you don't want me to come and pray for you when you open, let me pray for you both now, to which they agreed. Mr. Moody prayed that their business might go to pieces, which it did in a very few months. After the failure, one of the partners determined to kill himself, but when he was about to plunge the knife into his breast, he seemed to hear again the words of his dying mother, Johnny, if you get into trouble, pray. That voice changed his purpose and his life. He prayed for forgiveness and obtained it. In 1871, the terrible fire in Chicago swept away Moody's home and church. Two years later, having been invited to Great Britain by two prominent Christian men, he decided to take his friend, Mr. Ira D. Sankey, who had already won a place in the hearts of the people by his singing, and together they would attempt some work for their Lord. They landed in Liverpool, June 17. The two friends who had invited them were dead. The clergy did not know them, and the world was wholly indifferent. At their first meeting in York, England, only four persons were present, but Mr. Moody said it was one of the best meetings they ever held. They labored here for some weeks, and about two hundred were converted. From here they went to Sunderland and Newcastle, the numbers and interest continually increasing. Union prayer meetings had been held in Edinburgh for two months in anticipation of their coming. When they arrived, two thousand persons crowded Music Hall, and hundreds were necessarily turned away. As a result of these efforts, over three thousand persons united with the various churches. In Dundee, over ten thousand persons gathered in the open air, and at Glasgow, nearly thirty thousand, Mr. Moody preaching from his carriage. The press reported all these sermons, and his congregations were thus increased a hundredfold over all the country. The farmer boy of Northfield, the awkward young convert of Mount Vernon Church, Boston, had become famous. Scholarly ministers came to him to learn how to influence men toward religion. Infidels were reclaimed, and rich and poor alike found the Bible precious from his simple and beautiful teaching. In Ireland, the crowds sometimes covered six acres, and inquiry meetings lasted for eight hours. Four months were spent in London, where it is believed over two and a half million persons attended the meetings. Mr. Moody had been fearless in his work. When a church member who was a distiller became troubled in conscience over his business, he came and asked if the evangelist thought a man could not be an honest distiller. Mr. Moody replied, You should do whatever you do for the glory of God. If you can get down and pray about a barrel of whiskey, and say when you sell it, O oh Lord God, let this whiskey be blessed to the world, it is probably honest. On his return to America, Mr. Moody was eagerly welcomed. Philadelphia utilized an immense freight depot for the meetings, putting in it 10,000 chairs and providing a choir of 600 singers. Over 4,000 conversions resulted. In New York, the Hippodrome was prepared by an expenditure of $10,000, and as many conversions were reported there. Boston received him with open arms. Ninety churches cooperated in the house-to-house -house visitation in connection with the meetings, and a choir of 2,000 singers was provided. Mr. Moody, with his wonderful executive ability and genius in organizing, was like a general at the head of his army. Chicago received him home thankfully and proudly, as was her right. A church had been built for him during his absence, costing $100,000. For the past ten years his work has been a marvel to the world and, doubtless, to himself. 
Great Britain has been a second time stirred to its center by his presence. His sermons have been scattered broadcast by the hundreds of thousands. He receives no salary, never allowing a contribution to be taken for himself, but his wants have been supplied. A pleasant home at his birthplace, Northfield, has been given him by his friends, made doubly dear by the presence of his mother, now over eighty years old. He has established two schools there, one for boys and another for girls, with three hundred pupils, trained in all that ennobles life. The results for Mr. Moody's work are beyond computing. In his first visit to London, a noted man of wealth was converted. He at once sold his hunting dogs and made his country house a center of missionary effort. During Mr. Moody's second visit, the two sons at Cambridge University professed Christianity. One goes to China, having induced some other students to accompany him as missionaries. The other, just married to a lord's daughter, has begun mission work among the slums in the east end of London. The work of such a life as Mr. Moody's goes on forever. His influence will be felt in almost countless homes after he has passed away from earth. He has wrought without means and with no fortuitous circumstances. He is a devoted student of the Bible, rising at five o'clock for study in some of his most laborious seasons. He is a man consecrated to a single purpose, that of winning souls. Mr. Moody died at his home at East Northfield, Massachusetts, at noon, Friday, December 22, 1899. He was taken ill during a series of meetings at Kansas City a few weeks previously, and heart disease resulted from overwork. He was conscious to the last. He said to his two sons who were standing by his bedside, I have always been an ambitious man, not ambitious to lay up wealth, but to leave you work to do, and you are going to continue the work of the schools in East Northfield and Mount Hermon, and of the Chicago Bible Institute. Just as death came, he awoke as if from sleep, and said joyfully, I have been within the gate. Earth is receding. Heaven is opening. God is calling me. Do not call me back. And a moment later expired. He was buried Tuesday, December 26th, at Round Top, on the seminary grounds, where thousands have gathered yearly at the summer meetings conducted by the great evangelist. End of chapter 27「Chapter twenty eight of Lives of Poor Boys Who Became Famous. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Barry Eads. Lives of Poor Boys Who Became Famous by Sarah Knowles Bolton. Chapter twenty eight Abraham Lincoln. In Gentryville, Indiana, in the year eighteen sixteen, might have been seen a log cabin without doors or window glass, a dirt floor, a bed made of dry leaves, and a stool or two, and table formed of logs. The inmates were Thomas Lincoln, a good-hearted man who could neither read nor write, Nancy Hanks, his wife, a pale-faced, sensitive gentlewoman, strangely out of place in her miserable surroundings, a girl of ten, Sarah, and a tall, awkward boy of eight, Abraham. The family had but recently moved from a similar cabin in Harding County, Kentucky, cutting their way through the wilderness with an axe and living off the game they could obtain with a gun. Mrs. Lincoln possessed but one book in the world, the Bible, and from this she taught her children daily. Abraham had been to school for two or three months, at such a school as the rude country afforded, and had learned to read. Of quick mind and retentive memory, he soon came to know the Bible well nigh by heart, and to look upon his gentle teacher as the embodiment of all the good precepts in the book. Afterward, when he governed thirty million people, he said, All that I am or hope to be, I owe to my angel mother. Blessings on her memory. When he was ten years old, the saintly mother faded like a flower amid these hardships of pioneer life, died of consumption, and was buried in a plain box under the trees near the cabin. The blow for the girl, who also died at fifteen, was hard, but for the boy the loss was irreparable. Day after day he sat on the grave and wept. A sad faraway look crept into his eyes, which those who saw him in the perils of his later life well remember. 
Nine months after this, Abraham wrote a letter to Parson Elkins, a good minister whom they used to know in Kentucky, asking him to come and preach a funeral sermon on his mother. He came riding on horseback over one hundred miles, and one bright Sabbath morning, when the neighbors from the whole country around had gathered, some in carts and some on horseback, he spoke over the open grave of the precious Christian life of her who slept beneath. She died early, but not till she had laid well the foundation stones in one of the grandest characters in history. The boy, communing with himself, longed to read and know something beyond the stumps between which he planted his corn. He borrowed a book of Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, and read and re-read it, till he could repeat much of it. Then someone loaned him Aesop's Fables and Robinson Crusoe, and these he pored over with eager delight. There surely was a great world beyond Kentucky and Indiana, and perhaps he would some day see it. After a time, Thomas Lincoln married a widow, an old friend of Nancy Hanks, and she came to the cabin, bringing her three children. Besides, she brought what to Abraham and Sarah seemed unheard of elegance, a bureau, some chairs, a table, and bedding. Abraham had heretofore climbed to the loft of the cabin on pegs, and had slept on a sack filled with corn husks. Now a real bed would seem indeed luxurious. The children were glad to welcome the new mother to the desolate home, and a good true mother she became to the orphans. She put new energy into her somewhat easy-going husband, and made the cabin comfortable, even attractive. What was better still, she encouraged Abraham to read more and more, to be thorough, and to be somebody. Besides, she gave his great heart something to love, and well she repaid the affection. He now obtained a much-worn copy of Weems' Life of Washington, and the little cabin grew to be a paradise, as he read how one great man had accomplished so much. The barefoot boy, in buckskin breeches, so shrunken that they reached only halfway between the knee and ankle, actually asked himself whether there were not some great place in the world for him to fill. No wonder, when a few days after, Making a noise with some of his fun-loving companions, a good woman said to him, Now, Abe, what on earth do you suppose'll ever become of ye? What'll ye be good for if ye keep a goin' on this way? He replied slowly, Well, I reckon I'm going to be President of the United States one of these days. The treasured life of Washington came to grief. One stormy night the rain beat against the logs of the cabin, and flooded the volume as it lay on a board upheld by two pegs. Abraham sadly carried it back to its owner, and worked three days, at twenty-five cents a day, to pay damages, and thus made the book his own. The few months of schooling had already come to an end, and he was living out, hoeing, planting, and chopping wood for the farmers, and giving the wages to his parents. In this way, in the daytime he studied human nature, and in the evenings he read Plutarch's Lives and the Life of Benjamin Franklin. He was liked in these humble homes, for he could tend baby, tell stories, make a good impromptu speech, recite poetry, even making rhymes himself, and could wrestle and jump as well as the best. While drinking intoxicants was the fashion all about him, taught by his first mother not to touch them, he had solemnly carried out her wishes, but his tender heart made him kind to many who, in this pioneer life, had been ruined through drink. One night, as he was returning from a house-raising, he and two or three friends found a man in the ditch benumbed with the cold, and his patient horse waiting beside him. They lifted the man upon the animal, and held him on till they reached the nearest house, where Abraham cared for him through the night, and thus saved his life. At eighteen he had found a situation in a small store, but he was not satisfied to stand behind a counter. He had read too much about Washington and Franklin. Fifteen miles from Gentryville, courts were held at certain seasons of the year, and when Abraham could find a spare day, he walked over in the morning and back at night, listening to the cases. Meantime he had borrowed a strange book for a poor country lad, The Revised Statutes of Indiana. 
One day a man on trial for murder had secured the able lawyer, John A. Breckinridge, to defend him. Abraham listened as he made his appeal to the jury. He had never heard anything so eloquent. When the court adjourned, the tall, homely boy, his face beaming with admiration for the great man, pressed forward to grasp his hand. But, with a contemptuous air, the lawyer passed on without speaking. Thirty years later the two met in Washington, when Abraham Lincoln was the President of the United States, and then he thanked Mr. Breckinridge for his great speech in Indiana. In March 1828 the long-hoped-for opportunity to see the world outside Gentryville had come. Abraham was asked by a man who knew his honesty and willingness to work, to take a flatboat down the Mississippi River to New Orleans. He was paid only two dollars a week and his rations, and as a flatboat could not come up the river, but must be sold for lumber at the journey's end, he was obliged to walk the whole distance back. The big-hearted, broad-shouldered youth, six feet and four inches tall, had seen in this trip what he would never forget, had seen black men in chains, and men and women sold like sheep in the slave marts of New Orleans. Here began his horror of human slavery, which years after culminated in the Emancipation Proclamation. Two years later, when he had become of age, Abraham helped move his father's family to Illinois, driving the four yoke of oxen which drew the household goods over the muddy roads and through the creeks. Then he joined his adopted brothers in building a log house, ploughed fifteen acres of prairie land for corn, split rails to fence it in, and then went out into the world to earn for himself, his scanty wages heretofore belonging legally to his father. He did not always receive money for his work. For once, for a Mrs. Miller, he split four hundred rails for every yard of brown jeans, dyed with white walnut bark, necessary to make a pair of trousers. He had no trade and no money and must do whatever came to hand. For a year he worked for one farmer and another, and then he and his half-brother were hired by a Mr. Offutt to build and to take a flatboat to New Orleans. So pleased was the owner that on Abraham's return he was at once engaged to manage a mill and store at New Salem. Here he went by the name of Honest Abe, because he was so fair in his dealings. On one occasion having sold a woman a bill of goods amounting to two dollars and six and a quarter cents, he found that in adding the items he had taken six and a quarter cents too much. It was night, and locking the store, he walked two or three miles to return the money to his astonished customer. Another time a woman bought a half pound of tea. He discovered afterward that he had used a four-ounce weight on the scales, and at once walked a long way to deliver the four ounces which were her due. No wonder the world, like Diogenes, is always looking for an honest man. He insisted on politeness before women. One day, as he was showing goods, a boorish man came in and began to use profanity. Young Lincoln leaned over the desk and begged him to desist before ladies. When they had gone, the man became furious. Finding that he really desired to fight, Lincoln said, Well, if you must be whipped, I suppose I may as well whip you as any other man. And suiting the action to the word, gave him a severe punishing. The man became a better citizen from that day, and Lincoln's lifelong friend. Years afterward, when in the presidential chair a man used profanity in his presence, he said, I thought Senator C. had sent me a gentleman. I was mistaken. There is the door, and I wish you good night. Hearing that a grammar could be purchased six miles away, the young storekeeper walked thither and obtained it. When evening came, as candles were too expensive for his limited wages, he burnt one shaving after another to give light, and thus studied the book which was to be so valuable in after years, when he should stand before the great and cultured of the land. He took the Louisville Journal, because he must be abreast of the politics of the day, and made careful notes from every book he read. Mr. Offutt soon failed, and Abraham Lincoln was again adrift. War had begun with Black Hawk, the chief of the Sacks, and the governor of Illinois was calling for volunteers. A company was formed in New Salem, and Honest Abe was chosen captain. 
He won the love of his men for his thoughtfulness of them rather than for himself, and learned valuable lessons in military matters for the future. A strange thing now happened. He was asked to be a candidate for the state legislature. At first he thought his friends were ridiculing him, and said he should be defeated as he was not widely known. "'Never mind,' said James Rutledge, the president of their little debating club. "'They'll know you better after you've stumped the county. Anyhow, it'll do you good to try.' Lincoln made some bright, earnest stump speeches, and though he was defeated, the young man of twenty-three received two hundred and seventy-seven votes out of the two hundred eighty cast in New Salem. This surely was a pleasant indication of his popularity. It was a common saying that Lincoln had nothing, only plenty of friends. The county surveyor needed an assistant. He called upon Lincoln, bringing a book for him to study, if he would fit himself to take hold of the matter. This he did gladly, and for six weeks studied and recited to a teacher, thus making himself skilled and accurate for a new country. Whenever he had an hour's leisure from his work, however, he was poring over his law books, for he had fully made up his mind to be a lawyer. He was modest but ambitious, and was learning the power within him. But as though the developing brain and warm heart needed an extra stimulus, there came into his life at this time a beautiful affection that left a deeper look in the faraway eyes when it was over. Anne Rutledge, the daughter of his friend, was one of the most intelligent and lovely girls in New Salem. When Lincoln came to her father's house to board, she was already engaged to a bright young man in the neighborhood who, shortly after their intended marriage, was obliged to visit New York on business. He wrote back of his father's illness and death, and then his letters ceased. Months passed away. Meantime, the young lawyer had given her the homage of his strong nature. At first she could not bring herself to forget her recreant lover, but the following year, won by Lincoln's devotion, she accepted him. He seemed now supremely happy. He studied day and night, eager to fill such a place that Anne Rutledge would be proud of him. He had been elected to the legislature, and, borrowing some money to purchase a suit of clothes, he walked one hundred miles to the state capitol. He did not talk much in the assembly, but worked faithfully upon committees and studied the needs of his state. The following summer days seemed to pass all too swiftly in his happiness. Then the shadows gathered. The girl he idolized was sinking under the dreadful strain upon her young heart. The latter part of August she sent for Lincoln to come to her bedside. What was said in that last farewell has never been known. It is stated by some that her former lover had returned, as fond of her as ever, his silence having been caused by a long illness. But on the 25th of August death took her from them both. Lincoln was overwhelmed with anguish. Insane! feared and believed his friends. He said, I can never be reconciled to have the snow, rains, and storms beat upon her grave. Years after he was heard to say, My heart lies buried in the grave of that girl. A poem by William Knox, found and read at this time, became a favorite and a comfort through life. Oh, why should the spirit of mortal be proud? Mr. Herndon, his law partner said, the love and death of that girl shattered Lincoln's purposes and tendencies. He threw off his infinite sorrow only by leaping wildly into the political arena. The memory of that love never faded from his heart, nor the sadness from his face. The following year, 1837, when he was twenty-eight, he was admitted to the bar, and moved from New Salem to the larger town of Springfield, forming a partnership with Mr. J. P. Stewart of whom he had borrowed his law-books. Too poor even yet to pay much for board, he slept on a narrow lounge in the law office. He was again elected to the legislature, and in the Harrison presidential campaign was chosen one of the electors, speaking through the state for the Whig party. To so prominent a position already had come the backwoods boy. Four years after Anne Rutledge's death, he married, November 4, 1839, Mary Todd, a bright, witty, somewhat handsome girl, of good family, from Kentucky. She admired his ability and believed in his success. He needed comfort in his utter loneliness. Till his death he was a true husband, and an idolizing father to his children, 
Robert, Willie, and Tad, Thomas. In 1846, seven years after his marriage, having steadily gained in the reputation of an honest, able lawyer, who would never take a case unless sure he was on the right side, Mr. Lincoln was elected to Congress by an uncommonly large majority. Opposed to the war with Mexico, and to the extension of slavery, he spoke his mind fearlessly. The Compromise Measures of 1850, by which, while California was admitted as a free state, and the slave trade was abolished in the District of Columbia, the Fugitive Slave Law was passed, giving the owners of slaves the right to recapture them in any free state, had disheartened all lovers of freedom. Lincoln said gloomily to his law partner, Mr. Herndon, how hard, oh, how hard it is to die, and leave one's country no better than if one had never lived for it. His father died about this time, his noble son sending him this message, to remember to call upon and confide in our great and good and merciful Maker, who will not turn away from him in any extremity. He notes the fall of the sparrow and numbers the hairs of our heads, and he will not forget the dying man who puts his trust in him. In 1854, through the influence of Stephen A. Douglas, a brilliant senator from Illinois, the Kansas-Nebraska Act was passed, whereby those states were left to judge for themselves whether they would have slaves or not. But by the Missouri Compromise of 1820, it was expressly stated that slavery should forever be prohibited in this locality. The whole North grew to white heat. When Douglas returned to his Chicago home, the people refused to hear him speak. Illinois said, his arguments must be answered, and Abraham Lincoln is the man to answer them. At the State Fair in Springfield, in October, a great company were gathered. Douglas spoke with marked ability and eloquence, and then on the following day, Abraham Lincoln spoke for three hours. His heart was in his words. He quivered with emotion. The audience was still as death, but when the address was finished, men shouted and women waved their handkerchiefs. Lincoln and the right had triumphed. After this, the two men spoke in all the large towns of the state, to immense crowds. The Kansas-Nebraska bill worked out its expected results. Blood flowed in the streets, as pro-slavery and anti-slavery men contested the ground. Newspaper offices were torn down by mobs, and Douglas lost the grand prize he had in view, the Presidency of the United States. When the new party, the Republican, held its second convention in Philadelphia, June 17, 1856, Abraham Lincoln received 110 votes for Vice President. What would Nancy Hanks Lincoln have said if she could have looked now upon the boy to whom she taught the Bible in the log cabin? An incident occurred about this time which increased his fame. A man was murdered at a camp meeting, and two young men were arrested. One was a very poor youth, whose mother, Hannah Armstrong, had been kind to Lincoln in the early years. She wrote to the prominent lawyer about her troubles, because she believed her son to be innocent. The trial came on. The people were clamorous for Armstrong to be hanged. The principal witness testified that, by the aid of the brightly shining moon, he saw the prisoner inflict the death blow with a slung shot. After careful questioning, Mr. Lincoln showed the perjury of the witness, by the almanac, no moon being visible on the night in question. The jury were melted to tears by the touching address, and their sympathy went out to the wronged youth and his poor old mother, who fainted in his arms. Tears, too, poured down the face of Mr. Lincoln, as the young man was acquitted. "'Why, Hannah,' he said, when the grateful woman asked what she should try to pay him, "'I shan't charge you a cent, never.' She had been well repaid for her friendliness to a penniless boy. The next year he was invited to deliver a lecture at Cooper Institute, New York. He was not very well known at the East. He had lived unostentatiously in the two-story frame house in Springfield, and when seen at all by the people, except in his addresses, was usually drawing one of his babies in a wagon before his door, with hat and coat off, deeply buried in thought. When the crowd gathered at Cooper Institute, they expected to hear a fund of stories and a western stump speech, but they did not hear what they expected. They heard a masterly review of the history of slavery in this country, and a prophecy concerning the future of the slavery question. 
They were amazed at its breadth and its eloquence. The New York Tribune said, No man ever before made such an impression on his first appeal to a New York audience. After this, Mr. Lincoln spoke in various cities to crowded houses. A Yale professor took notes and gave lecture to his students on the address. Surprised at his success among learned men, Mr. Lincoln once asked a prominent professor, What made the speeches interest? The reply was, The clearness of your statements, the unanswerable style of your reasoning and your illustrations, which were romance and pathos and fun and logic all welded together. Mr. Lincoln said, I am very much obliged to you for this. It throws light on a subject which has been dark to me. Certainly, I have had a wonderful success for a man of my limited education. The Sabbath he spent in New York. He found his way to the Sunday school at Five Points. He was alone. The superintendent, noticing his interest, asked him to say a few words. The children were so pleased that when he attempted to stop, they cried, Go on! Oh, do go on! No one knew his name, and on being asked who he was, he replied, Abraham Lincoln of Illinois. After visiting his son Robert at Harvard College, he returned home. When the Republican State Convention met May 9, 1860, at Springfield, Illinois, Mr. Lincoln was invited to a seat on the platform, and, as no way could be made through the dense throng, he was carried over the people's heads. Ten days later, at the National Convention at Chicago, though William H. Seward of New York was a leading candidate, the West gained the nomination, with their idolized Lincoln. Springfield was wild with joy. When the news of his success was carried to him, he said quietly, Well, gentlemen, there's a little woman at our house who is probably more interested in this dispatch than I am, and, if you will excuse me, I will take it up and let her see it. The resulting canvas was one of the most remarkable in our history. The South said, War will result if he is elected. The North said, The time has come for decisive action. The popular vote for Abraham Lincoln was nearly two millions, one million eight hundred fifty-seven thousand six hundred ten, while Stephen A. Douglas received something over a million, one million two hundred ninety-one five hundred seventy-four. The country was in a fever of excitement. The South made itself ready for war by seizing the forts. Before the inauguration, most of the southern states had seceded. Sad farewells were uttered as Mr. Lincoln left Springfield for Washington. To his law partner he said, You and I have been together more than twenty years, and have never passed a word. Will you let my name stay on the old sign till I come back from Washington? The tears came into Mr. Herndon's eyes as he said, I will never have any other partner while you live, and kept his word. Old Hannah Armstrong told him that she should never see him again, that something told her so. His enemies would assassinate him. He smiled and said, Hannah, if they do kill me, I shall never die another death. He went away without fear, but feeling the awful responsibility of his position. He found an empty treasury and the country drifting into the blackness of war. He spoke few words, but the lines grew deeper on his face, and his eyes grew sadder. In his inaugural address he said, In your hands, my dissatisfied fellow countrymen, and not in mine, is the momentous issue of civil war. The government will not assail you. You can have no conflict without being yourselves the aggressors. Physically speaking, we cannot separate. The conflict began April 12th. 1861, by the enemy firing on Fort Sumter. That sound reverberated throughout the North. The President called for 75,000 men. The choicest from thousands of homes quickly responded. Young men left their college halls, and men their places of business. The Union must and shall be preserved, was the eager cry. Then came the call for 42,000 men for three years. The President began to study war in earnest. He gathered military books, sought out on maps every creek and hill and valley in the enemy's country, and took scarcely time to eat or sleep. May 24, the bright young Colonel Ellsworth had been shot at Alexandria by a hotel keeper because he pulled down the secession flag. He was buried from the East Room in the White House, and the North was more aroused than ever. The press and people were eager for battle, and July 21, 1861, 
the Union Army, under General McDowell, attacked the Confederates at Bull Run and were defeated. The South was jubilant, and the North learned, once for all, that the war was to be long and bloody. Congress, at the request of the President, at once voted five hundred thousand men and five hundred million dollars to carry on the war. Vast work was to be done. The southern ports must be blockaded, and the traffic on the Mississippi River discontinued. A great and brave army of Southerners, fighting on their own soil, every foot of which they knew so well, must be conquered if the nation remained intact. The burdens of the President grew more and more heavy. Men at the North, who sympathized with the South, for we were bound together as one family in a thousand ways, said the President was going too far in his authority. Others said he moved too slowly, and was too lenient to the slave power. The South gained strength from the sympathy of England, and only by careful leadership was war avoided with that country. General McClellan had fought some hard battles in Virginia, Fair Oaks, Mechanicsville, Malvern Hill, and others, with varying success, losing thousands of men in the Chickahominy swamps, and after the Battle of Antietam, September 17, 1862, one of the severest of the war, when each side lost over 10,000 men, he was relieved of his command and succeeded by General Burnside. There had been some successes at the West under Grant, at Fort Donelson and Shiloh, and at the South under Farragut, but the outlook for the country was not hopeful. Mr. Lincoln had met with a severe affliction in his own household. His beautiful son Willie had died in February. He used to walk the room in those dying hours, saying sadly, This is the hardest trial of my life. Why is it? Why is it? This made him, perhaps, even more tender of the lives of others' sons. A young sentinel had been sentenced to be shot for sleeping at his post, but the President pardoned him, saying, I could not think of going into eternity with the blood of the poor young man on my skirts. It is not to be wondered at that a boy raised on a farm, probably in the habit of going to bed at dark, should, when required to watch, fall asleep, and I could not consent to shoot him for such an act. This youth was found among the slain on the field at Fredericksburg, wearing next to his heart a photograph of his preserver, with the words, God bless President Lincoln. An army officer once went to Washington to see about the execution of twenty-four deserters, who had been sentenced by court-martial to be shot. Mr. President, said he, unless these men are made an example of, the army itself is in danger. Mercy to the few is cruelty to the many. Mr. General, was the reply, there are already too many weeping widows in the United States. For God's sake, don't ask me to add to the number, for I won't do it. At another time he said, well, I think the boy can do us more good above ground than underground. A woman in a faded shawl and hood came to see the President, begging that, as her husband and all her sons, three, had enlisted, and her husband had been killed, he would release the oldest that he might care for his mother. Mr. Lincoln quickly consented. When the poor woman reached the hospital where her boy was to be found, he was dead. Returning sadly to Mr. Lincoln, he said, I know what you wish me to do now, and I shall do it without your asking. I shall release your second son. Now you have one, and I have the other two left. That is no more than right. Tears filled the eyes of both as she reverently laid her hand on his head, saying, The Lord bless you, Mr. President. May you live a thousand years, and always be at the head of this great nation. Through all these months it had become evident that slavery must be destroyed, or we should live over again these dreadful war scenes in years to come. Mr. Lincoln had been waiting for the right time to free the slaves. General McClellan had said, A declaration of radical views, especially upon slavery, will rapidly disintegrate our present armies. But September 22, 1862, Mr. Lincoln told his cabinet, I have promised my God that I will do it and he issued the immortal Emancipation Proclamation, by which four million human beings stepped out from bondage into freedom. He knew what he was doing. Two years afterward, he said, It is the central act of my administration and the great event of the nineteenth century. The following year, 1863, brought even deeper sorrows. The Draft Act, 
by which men were obliged to enter the army when their names were drawn, occasioned in July a riot in New York City, with the loss of many lives. Grant had taken Vicksburg on July 4, and General Meade had won at the dreadful three days' fight at Gettysburg, July 1 through 4, with a loss of more than 20,000 on either side. But the nation was being held together at a fearful cost. When Mr. Lincoln announced to the people the victory at Gettysburg, he expressed the desire that, in the customary observance of the Fourth of July, he whose will, not ours, should everywhere be done, be everywhere reverenced with profoundest gratitude. He reverenced God, himself, most devoutly. I have been driven many times upon my knees, he said, by the overwhelming conviction that I had nowhere else to go. My own wisdom and that of all about me seemed insufficient for that day. On November 19 of this year, this battlefield was dedicated, with solemn ceremonies as one of the national cemeteries. Mr. Lincoln made a very brief address, in words that will last while America lasts. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining for us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to the cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that those dead shall not have died in vain that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that the government of the people, by the people, and for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Emerson says of these words, this, and one other American speech, that of John Brown to the court that tried him, and a part of Kosas' speech at Birmingham, can only be compared with each other, and no forth. The next year, February 29, 1864, the hero of Vicksburg was called to the lieutenant generalship of the army, and for the first time Mr. Lincoln felt somewhat a sense of relief from burdens. He said, wherever Grant is, things move. He now called for five hundred thousand more men, and the beginning of the end was seen. Sherman swept through to the sea. Grant went below Richmond, where he said, I propose to fight it out on this line if it takes all summer. Mr. Lincoln had been re-elected to the presidency for a second term, giving that beautiful inaugural address to the people. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widows and orphans, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. On April 9, 1865, Lee surrendered to Grant at Appomattox, and the long war was ended. The people gathered in their churches to praise God amid their tears. Abraham Lincoln's name was on every lip. The colored people said of their deliverer, He is everywhere. He is like the breast lord. He walks the waters and the land. An old colored woman came to the door of the White House, and met the President as he was coming out, and said she wanted to see Abraham the second. And who was Abraham the first? asked the good man. Why, Lord bless you, we read about Abraham the first in the Bible, and Abraham the second is the President. Here he is, said the President, turning away to hide his tears. Well did the noble-hearted man say, I have never willingly planted a thorn in any man's bosom. Five days after the surrender of General Lee, Mr. Lincoln went to Ford's theater, because it would rest him and please the people to see him. He used to say, The tired part of me is inside and out of reach. I feel a presentiment that I shall not outlast the rebellion. When it is over, my work will be done. While Mr. Lincoln was enjoying the play, John Wilkes Booth, an actor, came into the box behind him and fired a bullet into his brain, then sprang upon the stage, shouting, Sic Semper Tyrannus, the South is avenged. The President scarcely moved in his chair, and, unconscious, was taken to a house nearby, where he died at twenty-two minutes past seven, April 15, 1865. Booth was caught twelve days later, and shot in a burning barn. The nation seemed as though struck dumb, 
and then, from the old world as well as the new, came an agonizing wail of sorrow. Death only showed in their view how sublime was the character of him who had carried them through the war. While the body, embalmed, lay in state in the east room of the White House, tens of thousands crowded about it, and then, accompanied by the casket of little Willie, the body of Abraham Lincoln took its long journey of fifteen hundred miles to the home of his early life for burial. Nothing in this country like that funeral pageant has ever been witnessed. In New York, in Philadelphia, and in every other city along the way, houses were trimmed with mourning, bells tolled, funeral marches were played, and the rooms where the body rested were filled with flowers. Hundreds of thousands looked upon the tired, noble face of the martyred president. In Oak Ridge Cemetery at Springfield, Illinois, in the midst of a dense multitude, a choir of two hundred and fifty, singing by the open grave of him who dearly loved music, children of the heavenly king. Abraham Lincoln was buried. Bishop Simpson, now dead, spoke eloquently quoting Mr. Lincoln's words, Before high heaven and in the face of the world, I swear eternal fidelity to the just cause, as I deem it, of the land of my life, my liberty, and my love. Charles Sumner said, There are no accidents in the providence of God. Such lives as that of Abraham Lincoln are not accidents in American history. They are rather the great books from whose pages we catch inspiration, and in which we read God's purpose for the progress of the human race. End of chapter 28 Recording by Barry Eads End of Lives of Four Boys Who Became Famous by Sarah Knowles Bolton